Good to go. Okay. And the audience is open, so we're ready. We are Good recording. Evening. Thank you. Good evening. It's October 7th, 2024. This is a regular meeting of the town council. The open meeting law allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at a meeting location. However, I'd like to call attention to the fact that there are in fact seven of us in the town room tonight, along with the town manager and the clerk of the town council. This meeting is accessible in real time by Zoom, by phone, and as a live broadcast on Amherst Media Channel 9 and live stream. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the October 7th regular town council meeting to order at 633. I will call upon each councilor by name, the, by the name they have indicated they would like to be addressed. At that time, please unmute your mic and say present. Um, this way we know that we can hear you and you can hear us. Uh, please remember to mute your mic again. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devon Gothier. Present. Councillor Ette is not here yet. Lynn Griesmer is present. Councillor Haneke. Present. Uh, Bob Hegner. Present. Councillor Lord. Present. Pam Rooney. Here. Councillor Ryan is not here. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Here. Councillor Walker. Here. Thank you. There's no chat room for this meeting. If there's technical difficulties, Athena and I will be monitoring that. And if we have to, we will um, suspend discussion while we address them. Uh, the only change in the order of the agenda tonight is the discussion regarding the town manager goals will follow the action items. There, is, there will be one general public comment period during the meeting. Um, just very quickly, if we could put the announcements up on the board. So we have um, council meetings coming up on October 21st and November 4th, and then again on November 18th. On November 4th, we will meet at 6. We'll do the financial indicators with all of the other boards present or members of those boards. And then we'll move on to our regular town council meeting. On the 18th, we will begin at 5 with the reading period for the town manager evaluation. And at 6.30, hold a public forum on the FY26 budget, which is next year's budget. All of the committees of the council are scheduled to meet over the next couple of, over the next week or two. And I want to just mention that the Department of Equity and Inclusion is doing another Becoming Beloved Community event on October 11th from six to nine at the Banks Community Center, room 110. We are urged to, um, excuse me, register in advance. In addition to that, we have a slide that has been added to the packet that shows you all of the key dates for the election. Athena, you wanna put that one up? Okay. Um, something happened to my... Um, okay. Okay, uh, just to point out that we will have a early voting this year uh, and we will all, there is also opportunity to still register and to apply for a mail-in ballot. The last date to vote absentee ballot is November 4th by noon and the deadline for ballots is at five o'clock on um, November 5th, postmarked. Okay, thank you. There's no hearing, and so we will move to general public comment. If you are in the room, please make sure you have registered with Athena. If you are in the audience and you would like to make general public comment, please raise your hand now.
Athena, is there anyone in the room? Yes. Josna Reggae. Okay, Josna, if you would please come forward. Please state your name and where you live. Good evening, Josna Reggae, District One. I've emailed the council a longer version of this letter signed by 11 fellow residents. As we mark this somber anniversary of the October 7th Hamas attack on Israel, we must redouble our efforts to end this genocidal war. The carnage has been and continues to be enabled by a massive amount of US military aid, making all Americans complicit. Coming on the heels of the March 4th Council resolution in support of a ceasefire in Gaza, it was wrong of the town to send police to UMass on May 7th to support the arrests of peaceful protesters, including a number of Amherst residents. It blatantly disregarded the views of the townspeople on this issue and cost the town money in police overtime, use of police vehicles, and more. The Amherst residents who were arrested had their charges dropped but have been banned from the campus for two years. This is outrageous. One clause of the ceasefire resolution read, quote, we extend our support to all the brokenhearted and vulnerable members of our Amherst community who are directly affected by this ongoing crisis. Reaffirm our commitment to the safety of all members of our community and pledge to join with others seeking just and peaceful solutions, end quotes. Our own townspeople, including grieving Palestinian American residents, were arrested, zip tied, and held overnight with the support of the Amherst police, despite the stated commitment of the council resolution. And then, to add insult to injury, banned from campus. We call upon the council to demand that UMass C Chancellor Reyes rescind the campus ban on the Amherst residents and to charge our police chief and town manager not to respond in fu to future calls from the university to arrest peaceful protesters, especially those protesting in support of an issue that the council has itself supported. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Jasmine. We're going to move on to the consent agenda. The following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. After I read the motion, if there, anybody would like to, re, if a counselor would like to remove an item, please let me know. That does not require a second. To move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. 8A, authorization of November 5, 2024, presidential election warrant. 8D, referral of development of 2025 town manager goals to Go governance organization and legislation committee. Waiver of town rules of procedure, uh, rule 8.6 for agenda item 9A1, town manager appointments to the Community Preservation Act committee. 9A, Approval of the following town manager appointments, Community Preservation Act Committee Historical Commission Representative Robin Forden for a term to expire June 30th, 2025. Community Safety and Social Justice Committee Pat Romney for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. Council on Aging Helen Donovan and Fred Palmer for terms to expire June 30th, 2027. Human Rights Commission Silas McClung for a term to expire June 30th, 2026. Jaandra J. Pillay for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. 11A is approval of the following meeting minutes, May 6th, 2024, regular meeting. May 20th, 2024, public forum on appropriations outside the budget. May 20th, 24, regular meeting and September 20th, 24, regular meeting. Are there any items people would like removed? Then I seek a second. Second, DeAngelis. Thank you. Then we'll move to a roll call. I, I just uh, have one question. Yes. Bob, could you please hit your mic? Point of order. Sorry. Thank you. It's, it's, the, it's the state warrant. 
That's not correct. just the presidential. That, that is correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ette is absent. Lynn Griesmer is aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan's absent. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Thank you. The next item is under presentations and discussions. Although this um, packet appeared in your uh, packet in the past, um, I did not at that time say, is there anybody who has any questions? And so we have placed that in your packet again. This is the timeline in the process. It is perfectly similar to what we have done in the past. Um, and I have uh, used the shortening of the timeline, which we were able to achieve last year. Are there any questions? Councillor Haneke. Um, no questions, uh, just another request. I know we've shortened it, but I noticed that in this timeline, we're set to adopt the review, the annual performance review, barely 11 months into a 12 month review because we're set to adopt it on, I think, December 1st or 7th or some, whatever that first December meeting is. And it just seems strange to me to be adopting an annual 2024 review well before the month, the year is up mm -hmm. after only 11 months. So I, I guess it's another plug for if we can find any way to move this whole thing even later, I think it would be more appropriate. Right. Thank you. And I, I think all of us are painfully aware of that. One of the things I have asked uh, the town manager to do is to, if you will, foreshadow the completion of any of the goals in advance that he would hope to achieve by the end of uh, December. And this is an issue that has been before GOL and still not addressed at this time. Um, Councillor Ette, if you would just lean in, press your mic and say present. Present. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to the action items. And the first is the nuisance bylaw. And tonight we are joined by um, Police Chief Ting. Uh, Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. Thank you. Uh, and I don't see Rob Mora and it could be because I suggested we wouldn't get to this that fast. Um, hmm. There was a desire to have both um, Captain, T uh, excuse me, Chief Ting and uh, Building Inspector Rob Morrow here. Given that, I'm going to suggest that we flip this and go to item C, which is the Amherst Black Reparations Committee charge. Okay, and we can go ahead and put, I'm sorry, Paul. Uh, so the building commissioner said he's joining right now. Oh, okay. Then we'll go in the order as the agenda states. So we will, in fact, do the amendment to bylaw 3.26, nuisance property. Um, I'm going to place a motion on the table. I know we have several counselors have submitted in advance motions, but they need to make those motions publicly in a meeting. So we'll begin um, with the motion. And the motion is to rescind existing general bylaw 3.26 nuisance house and replace it with general bylaw 3.26 nuisance property as shown on page nine to 13 of the motion sheet. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. So at this point, the floor is open for discussion and also open 
for amendments. Perhaps we can take questions for the chief and Rob Mora first. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, hi, Rob. Welcome and welcome, Chief Ting. Are there questions for either Chief Ting or Mr. Morrow? I know one of the questions, Kathy, you have your, your hand up. Is that for that purpose? Okay. One of the questions that I believe you discussed with the committee that some counselors were very interested in, not all of us, and that is how do you see this being implemented, implemented and does it help create clarity for you? Either one? I can start. Um, Please go ahead. To be honest with you, I don't think it's going to change much in terms of how we operate. Um, a lot of the parameters for the nuisance house bylaw is, is pretty much the same in how we apply that. Uh, what has changed is uh, after the three strikes, then the last, the, the fourth strike goes to the landlord. And at that point, uh, the police department will formulate a plan uh, with the landlord and the tenants to try and mitigate that situation. Um, we've had several meetings uh, alongside with uh, Mr. Mora and the nuisance house bylaw certainly has provisions for violations that uh, his office would handle and we have a pretty clear cut understanding in terms of which uh violations would we uh adhere to and which ones would his staff take care of so um it, it's it's pretty clear from my vantage point thank you mr morrow yeah, one of the nice things about this proposed bylaw is it allows the police department and inspection services work together to, um, you know, get an improvement at a at a property. Uh, in the past, the 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 bylaw, the general bylaw, was only enforced by the police department. This version uh, gives some enforcement authority to inspection services staff, and as you know, our staffs work together uh, on properties that need a little bit more attention, and this will be a nice way to. Uh, use one bylaw for those situations where we're both dealing with uh, violations and trying to get corrections. Okay. Bob Hagner. Yeah, I have a question uh, for Captain Ting. Uh, um, Chief Ting. Chief Ting, excuse me, sir. Um, That's okay. <laughs> how, how many uh, nuisance properties by this definition do we have in town? How big a problem is it? I think that kind of varies from year to year. Uh, we utilize that usually um, for the most problematic um, noise complaints. It's usually houses that have like a lot of large scale parties and where there's a, a lot of complaints from specific neighborhoods and where there's a lot of underage and minor drinkers. Um, so it kind of varies to be honest with you. Um, it changes every single year because it, you know, we'll eradicate an issue from one neighborhood and then the next year it'll be a different neighborhood. Pam, Pam Rooney. Thanks. Uh, when I attended the District 2 meeting, there was a gentleman who asked what happens after the second and third violation and fourth violation and fifth violation. And uh, I, I wasn't really in a position to respond to him at the time, but the fact that they get a, a fine each time a ticket is issued has is is somewhat of a deterrent. Is a, can can either of you respond to to um, that question? From my portion, uh, certainly, whenever we issue issue a nuisance bylaw, our neighborhood liaison officer has a host of different landlords. Um, that he communicates with. And it's on a voluntary basis where they provide their email information. And if they want to know that their properties are in violation, um, our neighborhood liaison officer will let them know, even on the first violation. Um, and that way they are they have full knowledge that their property was um, has an issue. And hopefully that the landlords can keep an eye on that. However, this uh, new portion of the nuisance bylaw gives us an extra avenue in case of uh, a particular property, that's that's a, a serious problem. But usually after the first time, um, the recidivism rate is pretty low. 
Um, uh, so it's it's this just enhances it a little bit more. Okay, Kathy. Oh, I'm sorry, Rob. You had further comment. Uh, yes, I'd just like to add that um, you know by establishing the corrective action plan that this bylaw calls for, and the expectation that there'd be compliance or improvement um, is probably what will normally happen. Uh, but there is the opportunity to, um, uh, for rental properties anyway, there's the opportunity to increase inspection schedules and then ultimately it could impact the renewal or issuance of the next rental permit. So um, those are some new pieces on how, you know, uh, Chief Ting's work will connect to the rental regulations and, you know, we can work together to try to make sure that there's, um, you know, the best effort possible to get a property to perform better and get a man, you know, better management or uh, more attentive management for that property. Um, Captain, I'm, excuse me, <laughs> Chief Ting. No problem. Just to echo what, uh, what uh, Mr. Mora was saying, you know, a lot of times we will arrive onto a property, so we'll make observations that the inspection services might not necessarily see. And that way, when we see those ob observations of, of violations, we can document that and forward it to his office for his side to handle. So it will be, it's a nice partnership. Okay. Kathy, you had your hand up. Uh, one of the things I like this uh, proposed changes a lot. So I just um, want to, get a better sense of what we have now. Um, this would uh, create a tracking record. So how many times you've been out or what. Do we have that kind of record now? Or is it, I mean, we read about it in the newspaper. So is it, you know, first you're out for this and that. So in terms of record keeping, either Rob or, or Gabe, is, that a, is there a record that one could look at now associated with a property? There is from our end, yes. Anytime we issue any type of violation pertaining to nuisance bylaw or noise complaints, we we maintain a record of that. So that's something that that we could take a look at. Absolutely. Okay, Pam. I wanted to note also that this bylaw requires notification of the owner uh, and or the manager with every violation that is issued. It is not just a voluntary, if they happen to be on our list, we'll notify them. This is actually an effort to reach out to those owners um, to make sure that they're aware of the first and the second violation and certainly the, the third and subsequent. Thank you. Uh, Andy? Yeah, I just uh, have a question about enforcement uh, and it, we specify in the draft that we're uh, considering tonight, police officers and inspection services. We have two other public safety departments um, and fire EMS may have significant problems that they find during um, either their own responses to events that occur or inspections of buildings for fire um, uh, safety reasons. I was wondering, uh, and of course, we have the uh, uh, CRESS also as a public safety department. I was wondering why the two, those two public safety departments were not included. Um, I'm going to suggest that that may be a question that would either go to Chief Ting, Mr. Mora, or perhaps CRC. Anybody want to take it on? Yeah. Chief Ting? I can just mention that. I don't know if that was ever brought up in terms of uh, the fire department has their own avenues. If uh, if they find uh, violations within their fire codes, uh, for example, if uh, they find that somebody is covering up the smoke detectors or something along the, those lines, they do have an avenue to... Um, to uh, handle violators in that sense. In terms of CRESS at this point, um, issuing these citations it has always just been for sworn officers and sworn constables in terms of uh, handling those type of violations. Uh, I don't think that was ever mentioned yeah. 
Um, but that's something that's that's up to the CRC to take a look at. Okay. I just want to clarify that the question that Pam Rooney asked earlier about uh, subsequent violations, one in particular was regarding somebody who every year on the 4th of July sets <laughs> off fireworks. And so there's violations, but it's only one a year. And so one would assume that they might be fined for setting off fireworks every year. I don't know if there's the, any- The potential's there, the potential's there. Um, and I just want to add one more thing about about Crest. At this at this time, they don't have they don't hold hours uh, in the evening, so it really wouldn't be palpable for them to to uh, handle that at this time. Um, and they're not responding to noise complaints of that nature. So I'm not quite sure if that was the reason why, but that certainly plays a part of that. Okay. Are there any more questions? Councillor Walker. Um, thank you, Lynn. I just have a follow-up question to that for Captain Ting. Um, if there would be room, so I think that, you know, Crest is still growing. And so I wonder if in the future when they are open later hours and when they possibly might take um, noise complaints, which is something I know has been a conversation as to whether or not they will do so. And I don't believe there has been a definitive answer for the future on that. Would that then possibly shift this responsibility to them? And would that be possible under this bylaw? I can't really answer that because, uh, you know, I think that would be a, a question for Crest to kind of answer. Um, right now, I don't think they're at that point, um, but certainly if they were at the, at the juncture where they were going to be handling noise complaints, that's something that could be visited. Uh Paul Bachelman, you have your hand up. Yeah, I think that the way the bylaw is written, it only has it has two groups who can enforce the bylaw. So it would be an amendment to the bylaw to add additional people who could, like uh, I think we've heard the fire department and the crest department both mentioned in terms of the enforcement section. Um, it, it lists it, you have to list who is able to issue a citation for this. That doesn't mean they can't be involved. It just means they cannot issue a citation. Right. Or they can't be, they could be at it later if you don't want to do it tonight. Got it. Thank you. Are there any other questions at this time? Paul, did you have additional comment? Okay. All right. In that case, the motion's, motion has been made and seconded. If you would like to make an amendment to the to the bylaw, please raise your hand. We're going to start with Kathy Shane, and I believe Athena, you will have a um, version up on the screen, uh, so that as Kathy makes her motion, we can show what that motion is. Correct? Okay, Kathy. I saw Athena nodding her head. She did. <laughs> um, so. I, I spoke to this when we did the first reading that I think um, an additional clause should be added of, of uh, that goes with, I believe um, Pam is gonna speak to some wording changes with persistent um, problem, that if a property is uh, designated as a nuisance property um, over a first year and a second year that it potentially puts their rental permit at risk for rental properties. So I would make a motion to add a clause and I'm, I'm gonna do it in two ways. Um, Athena has a version that cleans up what I think would make the bylaw easier, but the basic clause that I make a motion to add is failure to correct. Um, and persistent violations over two years for rental property, a rental property that is designated a nuisance property two years in a row shall be at risk of losing a rental permit, as well as more frequent inspections as required under regulation B2 or regulations of the general bylaw 3.5. So that's the clause I'd like to add. They're actually in the current draft. May I seek a second? Sure. First. Is that a second? We have a second. Um, okay. 
and, and I'll speak to this in just a second. So structurally in the current section G, there are two clauses if you read toward the end about failure to implement corrective action and failure to contact enforcing agencies. I think it would all be clear, cleaner to move that into a section, a new H that says failure to correct. So on what you see up, I've moved those two with no wording changes to a new section H, which will renumber the current section H to I, to just move those down and add what I'm proposing. And that I wanna just make the case, uh, speak a little bit more about this. We were asked when we had a district one meeting, um, they, uh, what is the penalty if this just keeps reoccurring? And one of the things that was emphasized, uh, Councilor Ette was there with me, was that there would be a daily fine and people said, but what happens if it's year after year? Because there was some concern if it's a rental property, you can't simply get rid of the tenants. But if it happens over a two year period, you can rewrite the lease and put people on notice. So that's why I do it over a two year period that the the permit could be at risk. And it's, um, it's a potential that puts people on notice to do the corrective actions. So that's why I am proposing it um, to make this stronger. And just so I can say in our district, we have some properties when Bob asked, you know, do you have a list of them? We have some that we could point to um, and you can uh, print out a list of over a number of years, how many times the police have been out there year after year after year. So this would be trying to say there's a potential that you just can't be a rental property. And I put two years in as a reasonable time period. Um, so the original motion has been made and seconded. The motion to amend has been made and seconded. I'd like to stick to comments with regard to this particular amendment. And any action we're going to take on it. And then we'll come back to the other people who I, would like to make amendments to the motion. I have a point of clarification yeah. about the wording here. What is regulation B2? And I believe general bylaw 3.5 is different than general bylaw 3.50. And I think it's referring to the wrong one. So, Mandy, if you can fix that, that would be great. Um, I was trying to... In the what word new, new the, it was I wanted it to refer to the per, the new residential um, inspection one where we do mention nuisance. So regulation B two is what? <laughs> it, I I understand your question. You want to know where what are we referring to in general bylaw three point five? And in fact, what you are so also suggesting is that this may be general bylaw? No, no, there's two different references in 3A. Okay. Frequent inspections as required under regulation B2 or regulations for general bylaw 3.5. I don't think 3.5 is the correct bylaw, but I don't know what as required under regulation B2 is actually referenced. So I think I miswrote it. I want it to be under the, um, the inspection bylaw mentions nuisance. And so that's what I was referring to. So if we get the correct reference, if you if if you have violations of the nuisance bylaw under our inspection, you're gonna get annual inspections is what happens under that. So I would be happy to fix the reference there. That's what I was trying to refer to. Can you come up with the appropriate reference now? I will try to. Okay. Are there other comments or questions on this amendment? Pam? Thank you. Um, I, I like the um, pulling the failure to implement into one section. I think that is, that is easier uh, to find the information and with whatever the, re the references to the general bylaws and whatever the, uh, um, I think in concept, this is probably not a bad thing. Uh, it was one of the goals originally to put in putting this bylaw together since it came out of the rental re regulation registration program discussions. It was, you know, are there actions that, that properties take or the people that occupy the properties take that 
consistently are, um, are, are, are disruptive, persistently disruptive to their neighbor, neighbors. And we ended up dropping that out. But I think I think what Kathy is suggesting here, where it's actually over a two year period, it just says this property is consistently out of line. And there really has to be a wake up call. Maybe it's not fit for rental. Um, and and I think that's that's a reasonable reason to um, to include it here. Okay. Councillor Walker, you have your hand up. We're discussing this amendment at this time. Um, yes, thank you. I just have a couple of questions, um, and I'm not sure if they would be for Kathy or for Rob, um, but I'm wondering, so I'm thinking about this with the assumption that we're mostly targeting like student rentals. And so I'm thinking about the possibility of it not being the same renter in the second year. And so would that still be applicable if the property was determined a nuisance two years in a row, but they have different occupants? Um, and then my second question is about um, like more on the landlord side. So if they did receive this type of penalty and they weren't allowed to register their property, as a rental the following year, what would be the corrective action? Like, would they then be able to register it again in the future? And what would they need to do first in order to make that happen? I'm gonna ask Kathy first, whether that was in consideration with the motion, and then we'll go to whether uh, either Mr. Moore or Captain, um, God, geez, excuse me again, Chief Ting have any comments. So first I want to, I can find the section and it's, I'm referencing, it's the regulations for general bylaw 3.50 and Mandy is correct that it's 3.50. And then uh, under that, there is a B and then there is a uh, subsection that references if you're found in violation of the nuisance by bylaw and it cross references the nuisance bylaw, then it can be more frequent. So um, I think the, the best way to refer it is just to refer to the regulations under general bylaw 3.50, you know, remove that little subsection because it's B, 2, A, C, one, you know, it's too many steps down where you find the word nuisance, but it, it cross references the nuisance bylaw in that regulation. So okay. it would just be streamlining that to say in regulations of the general bylaw 3.50. Jennifer is the person that seconded. Are you fine with this a change? I am. Okay. Yes. Uh, I wanna go back to uh, the question that uh, Councillor Walker has asked, and that is if the tenants of the house change from one year to the second year, but they still the house can, continues to be a house that gets cited, how is that going to be handled with this sense of multiple violations? Are you asking what my thoughts are on it? Because my thoughts would be this is, um, if it's a second set of tenants, then the management and the owner haven't um, figured out a way to keep this under control. So it is this two year problem that if the manager and the owner understand that there is this new bylaw and that they were already in the corrective action, um, it, again, during our discussion uh, with people in district one, they were saying, well, you could put clauses in the leases then and, and cross-referencing really put people on notice. So it does involve, it goes one step up because as Alicia said, it could be a new set of tenants, but there's something about the management of the property that allows this to be uh, reoccurring. Okay. Uh, Rob, you had your hand up earlier. Do you want to speak to this, please? Yeah, I was going to say something similar to that. The, the language doesn't seem to re uh, consider the change in tenants. So 
uh, it really is uh, focused at the management plan for the property and having the owner or landlord address uh, address it in that way, so that the next uh, the next tenant, uh, see, you know, hopefully makes improvement to the to the issue. Councillor Walker, did you have a second question? Um, yes, sorry. My second question was about um, like a corrective plan. So, what would we be required if um, a landlord's ability to register as a rental rental property was taken away, um, how would they redeem that? This is a question that regarding how the corrective plan would work and once the property is moved off of the rental registration, is that what you're asking, Councillor Walker? Yes. Okay. In other words, how does a landlord, once they've been moved off rental registration, how do they get back to the point with, where they have a legally rentable property? Rob, thank you. I Yes, Rob. So I think it really is demonstrating that there's a change in the management of the property that will address whatever the issue is to eliminate the violation or to, to help ensure that it won't continue. So. Um, you know, it really falls back, at, I think, in this very general example would be the management plan and convincing uh, inspection services to reinstitute the permit or the Board of License Commissioners, if it's under appeal, to uh, issue the permit uh, based on what uh, the landlord or owner could uh, could tell us through the, the management plan on how the property is going to be improved and better uh, better managed to eliminate those violations. Thank you. Uh, Andy Steinberg, we're speaking to this amendment. Yes. Um, part of my uh, problem has been resolved already by changing the wording of the, um, uh, how it's set up for reference to regulations. I do consider the fact that um, we're adopting whatever happens to the regulations that if the uh, Board of License Commissioners changes the uh, frequency of regulations that we're, we're going with whatever is currently in effect. And I, I'm fine with that, but I just wanted to point it out. My other question though is uh, just in um, the language that introduces uh, three subsection three of H um, what is the word? Is it the, supposed to be the word and? Failure to correct and? It says failure to correct and persistent violations over two years for rental property. I guess, uh, okay, I'll, I'll accept that, though. I think that I had assumed that it was, uh, wondering if it meant any and not and. I see. Okay. Okay. Uh, Captain Ting, I'm, oh my God, excuse me. That's okay. Um, I, I have a, I'm, I'm gonna just write a chief. <laughs> chief there you go. Um, one common theme when we're talking about persistent violations, one common thing when we were reviewing this particular bylaw was that um, <clears throat> certainly the town's attorneys had looked at this and they had uh, referenced anything when you're, when you're giving something like persistent violations, they want a specific number. Um, so I guess I would recommend, you know, in section three here, it says failure to correct in persistent violations. Well, what is considered persistent, I suppose? That would be my question. Um, Mandy Joe, you have your hand up. I do not to answer that. I've got questions myself. Okay. Um, does anybody want to address the issue of and persistent violations, Kathy? Um, I knew that there was going to be another amendment to put the words persistent violation at the very beginning, but I think it would read fine, failure to correct over two years. But the the, the reason I put persistent is you can't get designated a nuisance property until you've had three. Right. 
So I see that as being designated in the second clause. Once you're designated two years in a row, you have had six yeah. uh, violations. And so you have a lot. So th that's what I was trying to do on a, the designation itself requires multiple times. So are you suggesting that we should remove the words and persistent? Well, I'm not sure I'm not sure whether it causes concern since our definition of a nuisance property is you have to have three before we designate mm -hmm. it you that way. Maybe the clarity would be failure to correct and designation as a nuisance property two years in a row would be the lead in and then it's repetitive of the second. Um, so you know I'm 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 not uh, wedded to specific wording. Uh, I think the clause A has the action in it. So it's being designated two years in a row. It's, it's, it's possible you could just get rid of the, the lead in and make A the clause, a rental property that is designated. Do you, do you understand I made it mm -hmm. a subhead? And I made it a subhead because originally I was thinking it had to stand alone under G <laughs> up above before I created this whole new section, realizing there were two other failure to corrects above. So, so what you're suggesting is that we remove the line that begins with three, failure to correct and persistent violations over two year years for rental property and make what is now A, three. Exactly. And then I think that's cleaner. Is that okay with you, Jennifer? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, Councilor Haneke. A couple comments on this. Um, this. Kathy speaks of designated two years in a row as if there had to be a new designation in year two. There is no automatic removal in this draft of the nuisance bylaw for removing a designation, which means once the third is there, that designation stays until under section G3E, the owner requests that it be removed. So it could sit there for five or six years before an owner requests that it be removed, even though there have been no more violations. So just because it's there for two years doesn't mean there's been more than three violations. Um, so I hesitate about that. Um, I hesitate about singling out rental properties for an additional penalty that non-rental properties do not have. I hesitate because the risk of losing a rental permit is not actually in for, for a designation of a nuisance property is not actually in general bylaw 3.50, which means general bylaw, whatever this number would be, is adding a penalty to a different bylaw completely, which doesn't sit well with me. Um, and I hesitate with the words as required under general bylaw 3.50 regulations, because right now they are, but they might not always be, and we are no longer the regulatory amender for general bylaw 3.50 regulations. That's the board of licensing commissioners, and they may at some point not require more frequent inspections if there's a nuisance property designation. We don't know. So this by saying as required under those regulations adds in a new requirement for regulations to a different bylaw and regulations, again, that's not within that bylaw, and it just doesn't sit right with me to put requirements for general bylaw 3.50 into nuisance property bylaw language. Uh, Councilor Haneke, is there any way you would amend three or you, would you just well, let's... not support it? So I'm not going to support this amendment as it is, and it's not my job to come up with Okay. how to do it Thank if you. I don't like this either way, but those are part of my problems with this. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer Top. Uh, well, then maybe we amend it back because it, it does say that 
once you're designated that the property owner would have to request that that be lifted, which if they correct it, we have every reason to believe it would be. So then maybe make it two consecutive years with three violations per year. That's that's fine with me. I think there is a, a um, definite difference between a homeowner living in the home and a property owner who is renting out the property. The second is operating a business. And I think like with a restaurant, if you were in violation of health codes, if you, for two years in a row, you have violations such that you are designated a nuisance property, then I think, and it doesn't say you have to have your, you that you, they have to remove the permit and that you cannot have the um, your permit renewed, but that that is an option for enforcement. And I th think you run that risk as a business owner who is not abiding by the town's um, you know, health and safety and nuisance bylaws. So I, I think there's a, an, a, a definite difference between an owner occupant and someone who's using their property as a business. Kathy? So as, um, so if there is wording that solves Mandy's problem that you just keep your nuisance property designation forever, if you don't appeal to it, I can make it that two years in a row you're designated because of frequent, which is that first clause. But I think um, I, people might remember I was not in favor of the inspection part of the rental permit bylaw that we put on the books. I thought we should have some provision that once you are a persistent cause of town services coming in, you should lose your permit. So yes, that is what I'm doing here, potentially putting that at risk. And I wasn't able to get that in. I always thought we'd do one strike, two strikes, three strikes, you're out, something that would say this can't go on year after year. It's a huge use of our town resources to be sending out what you see in the newspaper on some of these. And I'm hoping this doesn't happen two years in a row because up above what we just heard is there's going to be an attempt to work with people to say, let's, let's not have this happen. Let's have corrective action. But if you don't have the ability to take a permit away mm -hmm. on a rental property, you don't have the final kind of club to use. It's just fines. Um, and if you have fines, you can just increase the rent to cover the fines. And that's not that doesn't help the town in the way we're doing enforcing. And I would bet if the concern is uh, some somehow we're worried about homeowners, the number of times homeowners or nuisance properties I, in terms of what we're talking about here, I think is relatively small. What we're seeing is much more the, the, the parties, the cars and everything else. I'm not saying it never happens, but I think a homeowner that started having lots of fines will probably take corrective action. So that that is the rationale. So if the original wording that said persistent was too vague, so it's accumulate six times over two years, if I need to put that wording in, I'd be happy to. That's, that is the notion here, that it just keeps happening. Pam? Yeah, thanks. Um, it was either Chief Ting or Commissioner Mora that did uh, mention the the fact that so, that one might lose the ability to rent a property under Bylaw three point five zero, the Rental Registration Bylaw. And I wonder if if we could circle back to them and remind us all where that is covered. It's not it doesn't lay out a specific path to losing a license or losing a permit, but um, but but one of them mentioned it earlier, and I just want to make sure that people understand that. Um, please go ahead, Rob. So 3.5 3 has a provision that um, all local bylaw regulations, state and local health and building codes needs to be in compliance in order to receive your rental permit. So that's that's what I was mentioning is that uh, 
in the event that a property continues to have problems and doesn't uh, improve with the corrective action plan, then our ability to not renew or not issue the permit uh, is something that we would have to consider. I don't think there's a way to suspend or revoke, even with this language as written. You know, it's suggesting that you may lose your permit. I think it's losing your permit by not having it renewed. Um, but our suspension language in the bylaw in the in 3.50 uh, is in the case where order an order to remedy is not complied with. And I don't know where an order of remedy would ever cite uh, the issues that we're talking about through the, the this bylaw here. So I don't think there's that clear connection or clean connection mm -hmm. to suspension or revocation, but there is to issuance or renewal of the permit. And then the other uh, is the inspection uh, requ requirement. That's clearly in the regulations right now. So are you suggesting that the bylaw itself, uh, 3.50, essentially covers this and therefore there's no need for three? It, I think this is attempting to do something different that it, that won't probably happen because of the language in 3.50. What, what I think we have already without this language is the ability to deny the request of a permit issuance or renewal. So the timing might be that there's a delay in the penalty because the renewal might not come up for several months. It's not an immediate step to revoke or suspend. The permit would then, the next permit application would be denied, which is an appealable action to the Board of License Commissioners if we fail, if we deny issuance of the permit. So um, I don't think it's necessary, but I, but it also doesn't automatically prescribe, you know, these two year, two in a row situations uh, that, that this is attempting to do and, sus and effectively suspend a permit upon that you know, that second notice or that second uh, nuisance designation. So I don't think it would do that currently in our bylaw. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Haneke. Which brings me back to, I just don't believe it's appropriate to create a penalty in bylaw, a penalty for bylaw 3.50 that is listed only within penal in bylaw 3.26. That's just wrong. All penalties for bylaw 3.50 should be listed in bylaw 3.50. And that's not what this is. This is bylaw 3.26 creating a penalty for bylaw 3.50. And I just don't think that's appropriate. Um, to ask uh, the commissioner Mora a question, you can be in compliance of bylaw 3.26 if you've got a corrective action plan filed and approved and are implementing it, which would therefore not allow, would that compliance would then not be, so simply the designation of a nuisance property under bylaw 3.26 if we pass this is not in and of itself a reason to deny a permit renewal under 3.50 if you are in compliance with the corrective action plan. Is that correct or not? Yes, I agree with that. Okay. Thank you. Jennifer? Um, well, I was going to suggest that if we, I mean, if we were, were wordsmithing then for it not to say to be at risk of losing a permit, but to be at risk of not being able to renew your permit. that that's an option for clarifying that language. But it doesn't, it still does the same thing because simply des being designated a nuisance property does not put you at, well, I mean, puts you at risk maybe, but for non-renewal, but it's not non, I mean, maybe it works. I don't know. I don't like that we're trying to put a penalty in 3.26 for viol for 3.50 bylaw. If you want to add that penalty about not renewing a permit, put that penalty into bylaw 3.50, not 3.26. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments on this 
suggest yes paul you had a comment so i just want to clarify that this provision only applies to rental property not to properties that may be you know, we do have nuisance com complaints from people who live who are own their own homes so this would not apply to those properties in, in defining i guess and i guess we have a definition for rental property somewhere. there is a definition for rental property andy yeah, I'm getting a little uncomfortable by the Andy, way. please speak closer to the mic. I'm getting a little bit uncomfortable about the amount of time we're spending on this and the detail that we're going into trying to redraft as a group, uh, which is not an efficient process. I think that's why we have committees. And uh, I'm beginning to wonder whether uh, this and anything else that's suggested in amendments after we've heard what the other amend amendments are should be referred back to uh, CRC and GOL for clarity, consistency, and actionability before we actually take a final vote. Um, it, it's just that this uh, conversation is getting very complex and I think belongs in the committee. Jennifer? We've had this conversation in CRC and we even voted on it. Um, it. It did not pass CRC. I think it was a three to two vote. So that's how the amendment, I mean, I I didn't know the amendment was coming up tonight, but that's why, I, all to say that is why it is not in the bylaw that was proposed to the full council. So, and I don't know that we should send it back to CRC for the same vote we had last time. <laughs> uh, Paul, you still have your hand up. Okay. Pat DeAngelis. I do not believe that we should send this back. Um, Jennifer said it very clearly. It was voted down in CRC. I think making amendments on the fly doesn't work. And I so I agree with Andy about that. And I, I feel like we need to be careful. I know that's not the intention to waste council time but it is the impact of this kind of action. Anna. Um, I second what Pat is saying, and I, and I know that the council does not need to go along with what was voted in committee, but I would like to ask members of CRC in the future, if, an, a, if a proposed amendment was discussed, and especially if a proposed amendment was voted at CRC, it would be very helpful to let the council know that at the beginning of the discussion um, so that, we can know that this isn't the first time it's been discussed. Uh, that would be really helpful going forward. Jennifer, you still have your hand up. Uh, yes, I mean, CRC has also voted in the majority to recommend appointments to boards and committees that you know, are then voted differently at the council. So I don't have any issue with this coming before the council. We do that all the time. But in uh, this case, I would just say it probably is not worth it to send it back to CRC. Okay, Anna? That's not what I was saying, Jennifer. I specifically said it's fine that the council discussed this. It's helpful context to know what CRC's discussion was. So to be clear, I don't have a problem with this being in front of the council. I think it's a valid, well, while well, I have questions or concerns about it, I think it's a valid motion to make, but it's helpful to know what CRC has discussed in the past so that we're not just rehashing prior conversations. It's helpful to know what members of CRC talked about. I'm not, it's actually not about this motion specifically. It's more of if something has been discussed by CRC, it's helpful for, I'll speak for myself, uh, to for me to know that it has been and uh, what that discussion was like. Thank you. Kathy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just a quick reaction to the notion that we're doing this on the fly. We don't have to vote on it tonight. I was trying to get an additional clause in and unfortunately I can't serve on every committee but I would have loved to be on CRC and maybe I'll try next year but um, I brought this up the first time we discussed it as well so I'm not I, I just tried to craft wording that would do it if you look at regulations 3.50 around the rental property permit it goes on inspection, 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 and it has one little clause about nuisance property. So I wanted here to say it's a huge drain on town resources if there's a persistent problem with the management of a property. 
that results in multiple calls during a year on all sorts of different issues. So that if, um, and so Mandy said, well, let's just throw it into the rental, the rental permit in the middle of all the other regulations. Um, you know, we're inspecting on things, but we're not, it's not an enforcement on the nuisance. It cross-references the nuisance bylaw. It says if the nuisance bylaw has a violation, then maybe we'll do more frequent inspections. So there, it didn't seem to me unusual in this one to say if the nuisance happens in multiple years, there's a consequence for rental. They're both cross-referencing each other. Um, it's not, it's not um, out of sync. So, um, you know, if the majority of the council doesn't want to go along with this, then it won't go in. So this was my effort to make it stronger and give our team a stronger uh, impetus when they're going out saying this really has to stop. We can't do this year after year. Yeah. The motion for the original bylaw has been made, and now this is an amendment to that motion. It's been made and seconded. Are there any other questions? Pat, if you're going to call a question, I'm going to be doing that anyway. Thank you. I We can vote to call the question. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So we will begin uh, this vote on this particular amendment to this with Anna Devlin Gothier. I. Okay. You are amending this to include it. I understand. I voted aye. I got it. Thank you. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an <sighs> reluctantly an aye. Councillor Haneke. No. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan's absent. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Uh, no. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. No. Pat DeAngelis. No. It passes. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight in favor, four against, and one absent. We're going to move on to whether there are any other additional amendments. Councillor Haneke. So I have three, but they're separate motions. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with move to amend section B7 to delete the phrase, comma, offensive to community moral standards, comma. Second. All right. Is there any further discussion on that amendment? Councillor Haneke, did you want to speak to it? Um, this is just what we discussed two weeks ago in motion language. Pam Rooney? Uh, we can't hear it's you. The same, you it's the same as, as the motion or that I put in. Thank you. I, All right. So I Are there it. any other questions or comments on this? If not, I'm going to bring it to a question, to the vote. Okay. Um, and it is shown on the screen. And uh, I'm sorry. In this case, we will start <coughs> with Councillor Ette. Oh, Councillor Haneke, do you still have your hand up? Yeah, thank you. Councilor Rette? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councilor Haneke? Aye. Bob Hegner? Yes. Councilor Lord? Aye. Pam Rooney? Yes. Councilor Ryan's absent. Councilor uh, Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councilor Walker? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devon Gothier? Aye. It's 12 in favor, one absent. Councilor Haneke, your next motion. Uh, move to amend section B3 by deleting the phrase, quote, or otherwise occupying, end quote, and replacing it with the word at. Okay. Is there a second? Second, G. Angelus. Okay. Are there any questions about this change? I'll speak to this oh, one. Please. <laughs> Go ahead. So the definition is for occupant. And so in and of itself, it's a circular definition, but because um, occupying and occupant are 
the same thing. But um, my concern is actually more that occupying is different than residing. And I believe the definition is intending to reference residents, not anyone who happens to occupy that at any particular point when the notice was sent that could be a visitor, it could random person that happens to be there. And so I'm just seeking to clarify it more to residents than anyone who happens to be present. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Pam Rooney? Yeah, I don't understand. So you want it to read person or persons with the legal right to reside or who is residing at a particular parcel? Isn't that the same as the legal right to reside at? So I believe those two clauses are meant to, this is just my guess, legal right to reside are those on a lease if it's a rental or the owners um, if it's yeah. not a rental and who is residing at would be those that meet the definition of re re residence for state law purposes which might be more than the owners of the property or those on the lease if it is a rental pam did you have further questions no okay seeing no further questions we're going to bring this to a vote um we're going to start with Councillor Ette. I actually, I guess we're starting with Lynn Griesmers and I, Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Cam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan is absent. Uh, Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Patsy Angelus. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. That passes 12 in favor, none opposed, one absent. Next one, Mandy John. I'm sorry, thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, this is my last one, I promise. This one was also discussed a couple weeks ago. Um, moved to amend section A by adding the phrase, quote, repeated or persistent after, quote, public nuisance by the and amend sections B7 and C2 by adding the phrase, quote, repeated or persistent after the phrase, quote, but is not limited to, end quote. Okay, is there a second? Second. Thank you, we have a second. Uh, would you like to speak to this motion? So this is a goal of, suggested by Councilor Ryan, who hasn't here, he had suggested this to CRC, in an email to CRC, but also it came up at the last discussion of um, what is nuisance. And we were going for that repeated sort of thing when you're talking about uh, some of these general bylaw violations. And so this this amendment seeks to get to that that sort of intention of this is not, a nuisance property is not necessarily a one-off noise violation. It's the repeatedness of the noise violation or the repeatedness of the littering violation or the repeatedness of the junked car in the front yard violation um, and or the persistence of that. And I know Chief Ting would say the lawyers want numbers, um, but, but we're trying to get to a concept here of intention is nuisances over a course of time. And I thought those three parts where this phrase would go in were the purpose and then the the definition of nuisance property and then the further explanation of nuisance is. Um, Athena, would you please show the other places in the bylaw that this is being inserted? Please don't wait. It'll, t it'll take me just a moment. So if you want to go ahead and I'll get that up. Okay. Well, we're ready to vote. So we'll just hold on. Unless there's any other questions. Um, does it, is there anybody that feels uncomfortable voting without seeing the other places? If not, we'll move to a vote. Oh, I'm sorry, Rekha. Uh, Councilor Etta. Okay. 
I think we can wait. Okay, thank you. Pam Rooney. Hi, I'm, I'm a little curious. So I have two am proposed amendments that are almost identical to what was just presented by, by Councillor Haneke. Um, what's the order of business? Do you just pick the first person in the alphabet with the first amendment or how do you go through the, if, who's, if who's got amendments? Have, yeah, if you have one that particularly pertains to this, you should at least now discuss it, whether you place it in a motion, but discuss it so that you do have an opportunity to introduce it to the group. So, I, and, as uh, I just said, it's almost identical to what Councillor Haneke just proposed. I'm just curious at what point do you continue to go through the folks with, with amendments? We'll continue to go through them until we're done. Okay. with all people who want to amend. But if this one in particular, you had something that you felt was a better phrase or something, you can certainly propose that. Okay, so this is the second place where it appears. Second and third. It's And third, thank it's you. B7 here and C2 here. Okay. Um, Pam? Oh, I'm sorry. It's C2 here. I'm sorry. Oh. I'm sorry. I'll have to ask for clarification from Councillor Haneke. The The phrase that you said fo it follows is in here it twice. Is in C2, the, where, where your cursor is now not C2A. Okay. I know it sounds weird, but it actually reads properly given what A, B, and C, how they read. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any questions or comments? And Pam, would you like to talk about where you what you had said at this point? No, I think she covered it pretty well. Okay. I'm just curious how we were going to get to each and every one's different proposals. Okay. Are there any other questions on this? Then we'll move to a vote. Um, Councilor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hagner? Yes. Councilor Lord? Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Councilor Ryan's absent. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councilor Ryan? I think you uh, mean Walker. Sorry. Councilor Walker? Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Uh, Anna Doan Gothier? Aye. Councilor Ette? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. It's unanimous with one absent. Are there more additional amendments? Please raise your hand. Athena, how many, can you just tell us the different uh, counselors that submitted amendments to you? One was Councillor Rooney. That, that was the only other um, set of amendments that I received were Councillor Rooney's. Okay. Uh, uh, Pam, did you have any other amendment you would like to make at this time? No. Okay. Then we are now moving to the bylaw itself, and it's to rescind existing general bylaw 3.26 nuisance house and replace it with general bylaw 3.26 nuisance property as amended and shown on page 9 to, 3, 9 to 13 of the motion sheet. Is there any, there, uh, that motion has been made and seconded. Is there any question? Seeing none, we're going to move to a vote. Bob Hagner. Aye. Councilor Lord. Can you clarify, this is not an amendment, this is for the- This is the full bylaw, yes. Nay. Oh, uh, Pam Rooney. Yes. Uh, Councilor Ryan's absent. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councilor Walker? No. Patsy Angelos? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Councilor Ette? Aye. Lynn Griesmer's an aye. Councilor Haneke? Aye. 
10 in favor, two opposed, and one absent. The motion passes. Um, I'm going to suggest that we take a 10 minute break and actually um, we'll return at 8.05. It's a little more than 10 minutes, gang. 8.05, thank you. Please turn your mic off and your picture and turn your picture back on when you return. And I wanna thank Captain Chief Ting and Rob Mora for joining us.
Okay, we're going to start reconvening. Please turn your video back on if you're here. Thank you. Pam, are you back? And Councillor Walker. Walker. Yes, I am. Thank you, Lynn. Great. All right. Um, the next item on our agenda is the um, Amherst Black Reparations Committee charge. I'm going to make a motion to put the charge and look for seek a second to adopt the Amherst Black Reparations Committee ABRC charge as presented. Is there a second? Uh, second, Dublin Gothier. Thank you. Okay, the floor is open for discussion. Uh, Councillor Lord. Yes, thank you. Um, I think I'd like to make an amendment. I don't know if this is what you do, but uh, um, about changing. Uh, actually, excuse me. You know what? I should have called on Councillor Anna, thank who you. is chair of GOL, to give a give a report. Thank you. Go thank ahead. Thank you Anna. so much. Um, yeah. and first off, I want to thank. 
Athena for um, reminding me that I missed a couple things in my report and I apologize for that. I will happily uh, send an edited one with the members who were present, et cetera. I apologize that I missed those items in the report. So this charge uh, was initially drafted in the, um, in the AHRA final report. Um, when GOL met, we were joined by two former members of that committee um, where they shared that their draft truly was draft material and that uh, we should be able, we should go through it with them very thoroughly. And uh, we made those edits in collaboration with um, uh, Dr. Shabazz and Michelle Miller, uh, who were able to join us for that. GOL looked at this uh, over the course of, of several different meetings and where we landed is the charge that's in front of you. You'll remember that you had a charge in front of you at our last council meeting uh, that we then brought back to committee to make edits and bring into proper form. So what you have in front of you is a charge for a successor body to the uh, AHRA titled the Amherst Black Reparations Committee Charge. And this committee has sort of a two pronged uh, approach as, as per the discussion of GOL. What we, did, what we discussed was that this committee's first job is really to look at those AHRA recommendations and prioritize them. They are not, uh, they were never intended to be by AHRA uh, a complete checklist of everything that needs to be done within the next two years, right? So this body's first task is to figure out what recommendations are feasible and when, and present those to council to, to make those recommendations for council to adopt going forward. After that, this body has an ongoing obligation and ongoing res responsibility to consult regularly with the black community about allocation of funds, um, accept proposals through a process that they will determine and collaborate with other relevant entities. So these are, this, this charge, as you read through it, you'll notice is sort of a on the, in the first part of this body's work and then on an ongoing basis. I'm happy to take questions from the group and uh, I'd look to my fellow members of GOL if there's anything missing from what I just shared that you would like to share with the body. Um, I will note, oh, sorry. I will note that uh, I know that the term of appointment um, is a area that I think we will want to discuss as a body um, from, the, from the two members who um, who had joined us, whether it be two or three years. Thank you. And I wanna recognize that both Dr. Shabazz and Michelle Miller are in the audience tonight on Zoom. So I'm uh, Councilor Haneke. Councilor Lord was first. Thank you. Councilor Lord. Thank you. So I, if this is a discussion, I would love to talk about exactly what Councilor De Devler said, changing the term of appointment, the length of appointment from three years to two with the possibility of renewal. Okay, so the amendment would be uh, I, where it says term of appointment, it would say two in parentheses, two years. Would you like me to make it as an amendment or is this a discussion? It can be a motion. Oh, you, you move be it and then it's, okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> so you're, this, you're moving it as a motion? This is my first motion. I move to change the length of the term from three years to two years with the possibility of renewal, please. I second that. Thank Walker. You. Thank you. Uh, and you know, in the when in the House and Senate, when the person makes their maiden speech, we kind of applaud. So there you go. Uh Councillor Han, is there are there discussions about the length of the term? Kathy? Uh, yes, I'll speak to that. Um, I think, I think I would worry about two years for the following reasons. Um, this committee is going to have to get familiar with the amount of money that might be available to spend and try to come up with some sort of process to gather proposals and then bring it to back to the council because it's tax dollars where we'll have to be voting on it. And I think you know, one of the things we talked about in finance is the possibility to increase the pot that's available in a year by doing an every other year, a two year kind of allocation. But if you're only on it for two years, setting all of that up is going to be difficult and understanding what the limits are 
and setting a process up for applications, um, I think will take more time. So I know when the charter was set up, the council's term was three years for the first term and then went to two. I think with the thinking that when setting it all up is done, it's gonna take a lot of time and discussion. Um, I think maybe three years would have been good long-term too, but I, I'm worried that two years is too short for to grapple with a series of complex issues in terms, including, I watched the CPA, the, uh, the Preservation Act group, try to get familiar with how for people to submit proposals and to price them out to put it and then to evaluate them and figure out whether there's a priority setting. There's a lot of work that has to go into before a dollar can be sent. So I think two years is too short. Um, Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Um, two things here. One, my first question is, Councillor Lord's motion specified to change it to two years with the option for renewal. And I just wanted to clarify on the language there, our committee charges typically just list the number of years. And so I wanted to confirm that the option for renewal is a given um, and, and does not need to be specified. And th that's a question because I do not know. And I'd like to confirm that. I, I'm going to go to the town manager, but I believe the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Okay. okay. Thank um, you. So then I think my question is if Councillor Lord would accept a friendly amendment to her motion to just say the two, two years. I accept a friendly motion. Thank you. And then does, I think Councillor Walker needs to accept that as well as the seconder. Yes, I do. Thank you. Thanks. Um, my other point was with this one, we were modeling, uh, or a lot of our conversation talked about how this committee, the closest committee in nature of work is the Community Preservation Act Committee. And um, for a lot of the reasons that Kathy just stated, uh, we kept the, the term at three years um, and the CPA terms are also set for three years because of the learning curve that it takes to um, move through that allocation and, and budgeting process. And we don't necessarily know what that looks like for this group, um, but I, I just wanted to explain some of the rationale behind three years. I'm not necessarily convinced that three years is that much better than two. Um, right now, I think we're seeing so many challenges recruiting folks to serve that if two years would make this more palatable or feasible for people to to do I can understand moving it to two but I wanted to just clarify that we were looking at CPA when we um, looked at the three years as well okay oh Councillor Etta I was wondering if the renewal is automatically for two years and if there's a maximum length of renewals Paul. So uh, under the charter, whenever a new committee is formed, uh, section 9.12 D, I think, says that people will appoint it for various terms so that they so they don't all expire on the same year. So it's it's the appoint the first appointment can be at varied years. Um, there's no automatic renewal, but it's uh, subject to reappointment by the town manager and confirmation by the by the town council. And we, we generally try to follow a, a policy of two, three-year terms or six years. Um, the housing trust has two-year terms, for instance, and that's by state law. Um, so uh, we try to have some longevity, but not for people serving forever. Thank you. Pam? I wondered if it would be possible for Councillor Lord to actually get to speak to her motion and she could explain why she was talking about two years. I would love to hear from her. Okay, Councillor Lord. Um, thank you. Truthfully, I would love, it's complicated, but I would have maybe two positions out of the five be three year and then so that you're not maybe getting a new committee every other two years. Um, I'm speaking to this motion. We're hoping to draw in some people. At least I would like to see um, BIPOC people represented on this group. I was on the African Heritage Reparations 
original one that met for two years and we ended up meeting weekly and doing a lot, a lot of work. There was a lot of labor, a lot of love, but um, I think people are working really hard, especially families that have been strategically underserved. Um, so maybe working two, three jobs, doing all this stuff that makes being on committees tricky. If we looked across our committees, I'm wondering if we have a lot of maybe people who are retired who have extra time, or maybe people who have flexible jobs, I'm sorry to go on and on, where they can take the time during work to go be in a meeting, and how do we make it more accessible, um, especially for our BIPOC families or other underserved um, community members. And maybe a two year term, which still feels long, but that to me will attract more people than, oh, three years, what? Then my daughter is gonna be in middle school. I don't even know what you're talking about. So I'm just trying to think of as a person who's been stressed out, working really hard, long hours, love to serve the town, wanna to find ways to serve the town, that maybe a two year um, might be mm -hmm. more appealing. And I'm also not against splitting it so that's three for two and maybe two for three, but that's a whole nother thing that I wasn't ready to bring up for my first motion. Any other questions, please let me know. Yeah. Um, I do have a question. Is there a possibility of appointing, say, three of the people for two years and two people for three years and setting up the rotation that so you don't have as much turnover within one year? I think ultimately there will be major turnover every yeah. sixth year or whatever. Everybody will be up for if you do it that way. Okay. So I, I think it. what you want to do is yeah. stagger, right? This sounds like a charter debate. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Okay, the motions, uh, the motions on the table, and now there's a motion to amend. It's to amend the appointment so that it's two years. Um, Councilor Ette. I I do agree on one hand that two years would be more palatable for those who, which includes all of us who are busy with other things. But precisely because of that business, what that means is you may not be able to spend as much time getting up to speed. And this goes to what Kathy had said. I have spent about a year on the council and frankly, I still think I'm a caterpillar who's looking for wings. <laughs> so I think there's a way in which we could stagger and that would be helpful. So there would be those who already have a head start and then others who pr precisely because of their business will go for those two years, but I'd be hesitant to support anything that is strictly two. Okay, are there any other questions or comments? Yes, Bob. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I served as a resident member of the finance committee for several years and my appointments I believe were for two years. Um, so uh, if, if it's uh, sufficient for the finance committee, I think it's sufficient for this body yeah. i think two years is is enough time to get up to speed on the issues um and you know quite frankly the counselors are only two years now <laughs> and there are new counselors every year um, that need to get up to speed with all sorts of things in town and i think counselors do a pretty good job of getting up to speed so i i would support two years so the amendment is on the floor to change it from three to two years. Pat, do you have a question? Well, I'm just saying that basically I think two-year council terms are too short. Um, I would love it if we were th always three years. Um, I think that there is a difference between uh, the kind of, hmm, I'm going to question myself. What I was going to say is, there's a difference for someone like you who came in with financial background being able to get up to speed. Uh, and the way I'm thinking or correcting myself is if you are a man or woman of color, uh, you're up to speed <laughs> on what things are like. Uh, so, um, so maybe I'm wrong about that, but I 
really would like to see a mix of three and two year. Councilor Lord. I would like to just also say that um, having been on the school committee, the reparations committee, and now the town council, the volume on the town council is going to be significantly greater and the learning curve sharper than this committee. This committee is as important and all of this stuff, but the sheer volume of what you have to know and learn and all these other subcommittees is so, yeah, thank you. So the motion's been made to amend the charge to be for two-year appointments. We're going to move to the question. Uh, Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Did you say yes? Yes. Thank you. Count, um, Councillor Ryan. Kathy Shane. No. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. No. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ette. No. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Yes. Motion passes. Uh, let's see. Uh, nine in favor, three opposed, one absent. That's the motion on the amendment. Now, are there any other questions or comments? Yes, Councillor Haneke. So I have a lot of questions about this. Um, and I know some of them will seem very basic and probably were discussed in GOL. I'd just like a little bit more probably um, explanation of some of them. Um, Particularly the first two, well, I think they're the first two, review the recommendations in the AHIR final report and establish feasibility and priority levels of the AHRA recommendations. It seems to me, and, and I know um, Anna talked about this a little bit in her in explanation of the committee, committee's deliberations, but the final report had recommendations in it. And the council's never talked about those recommendations. And it seems to me that it's now the council's job to talk about them and prioritize them and determine their feasibility and given what the report said. So I, I read those two bullet points and I wonder, are we just asking this new committee to redo the work of the AHRA and come back to us after redoing that work. So those two, I'd like a little bit more explanation on how what they would be doing is different from what is already in the report that the AHRA has provided us. And now it's our job to actually have those tough discussions. Um, the advise and make recommendations to the town council on expenditures of funds. Uh, I, I wonder whether this means, does this mean that the council can only or is this intended to mean that the council should only be allocating funds based on recommendations from this committee? Uh, similar to, you talked about the CPA committee, we can only allocate CPA funds if it's recommended from the C CPA committee. Is that the intention here? Or would the council be able to allocate funds outside of those recommendations? And legally, I believe we could, because I don't think this charge changes that, but I'm wondering if the intention is that the only allocations we would make would be based on the recommendations of this committee or whether there's an intention for us to be able to make allocations outside of those recommendations. Um, the bullet point, sorry, there's so many here, <laughs> accept proposals from the community through a process determined by the body. Um, I get that bullet point, but I ask, um, don't they need to set up a process for deliberating on the proposals, not just a process on how to accept proposals and what those proposals need to um, include? Um, or is the that deliberation process expected to be determined by the council? Um, I think in an earlier set of comments, Kathy Shane, when we had originally sent about a year ago questions to GOL, 
she had suggested a wording of a clear set of written guidelines regarding what activities might be eligible um, or establishing a process and solic soliciting for po and all. Um, and then the last bullet point of collaborating with town committees to pursue reparative projects and initiatives where shared goals are present. Um, does this mean that the committee, if we establish it, can establish its own reparative projects? outside of whatever the council adopts per recommendations or per the AHRA report and any discussions in the future we might have? Is this, are we charging this committee with an ability to establish its own projects and priorities and things to do? Um, on the report side, um, out, uh, uh, that goes back to you know ongoing outreach efforts, outreach, what outreach efforts on what um, is that on the bullet point on consulting regularly with black community about allocation of reparations or is there another expectation of outreach efforts? Um, the work on pursuing reparative projects goes back to my last question on collaborating with town um, committees. Is this where they, would they, if they pursue things separately from whatever the council may adopt. Um, and yeah, and then is was there a reason that the reports are only coming to the town council or should they also go to the town manager too? Um, and yeah, so the, sorry, it's so much, but those are my questions. Anna, do you wanna address those or do you wanna have Kathy go next? Why is it me? Um, I'd like to address these, please. And uh, I'm going to do my best. And Mandy, I'm, I I took notes, but we'll see if I got them all. Um, so the first question was, why are they prioritizing versus the council? And the reason is that what GOL discussed is that the council is not the body with the knowledge of this, the experiences of this particular population necessarily to be the group to to determine those um, priorities, right? The amount of recommendations in the AHRA final report is immense. Um, the report is 161 pages, right? I'm trying to scroll down to the correct page of the, the charge so I can pull it up but um, to reference because it had to reload, but it's a big report. We wanted this body to look through and, and determine priority level to recommend to the council. This group isn't necessarily saying we will be doing X, Y, Z. This group is saying, these are the things that we would recommend the council approach first. Um, otherwise, this, this body is trying to prioritize all of these different recommendations. And I just don't think that that, I mean, not just me, GOL, uh, in conversation with, with our two representatives from AHRA, did not think that that was the appropriate course of action. Um, we're not asking them to recreate the work of AHRA. AHRA made an incredible set of recommendations. This body is saying these are the ones that should be tackled first. And this body is looking to see which what the feasibility of those are versus putting that work onto the council. Um, so I think hopefully that answers the first question. Um, when I read the, uh, da, 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 Athena, can you scroll down a second? The accept proposals from the community through a process determined by this body. Um, I appreciate your, your comment in terms of the process for uh, deliberating versus accepting. I understood this to mean including the deliberation, um, but if we need to be more clear on that, that's absolutely something that can be discussed by the council, um, but I, had made the assumption that a process determined by this body included a deliberation process. Um, but if that's not clear, we should clarify that. Um, are we allowing them to establish their own recommendations and pursuing reparative projects and initiatives? That was a topic of big conversation at GOL. And one of the things that we talked about was while the AHRA report is a phenomenal starting block, this body will continue hopefully in perpetuity, uh, and that they giving them the ability to be responsive and uh, flexible if needs arise and respond to community needs. We're having them do all of this outreach um, and they should be able to pursue uh, 
or pursue recommendations. Again, all of everything needs to be a recommendation to the council, but that this body should have the ability to um, make those recommendations to the council, even if they aren't necessarily in that first round list that they're uh, approaching. And I'm hoping Pat will say something more eloquent than I just did. Um, and then why reports uh, are only sent to the council, why not also the town manager? I think that the assumption is that the town manager hears those when they go to the council and that uh, when we looked at other groups reporting requirements, it was to the council um, and that's where they went as well. I, I'm sure I missed about four things, uh, so I'll, I'm happy to take clarification, but if, if it's okay, Pat, are you speaking to responding to Mandy Joe's questions as well? Somewhat, but I'd like to hear from Kathy first. Okay, I wasn't sure if you wanted to jump in to respond first, but uh, all right, we can, Mandy, did that, did I miss any? Um, you missed the one about expenditure funds and whether the intention is that the council right. would only expend funds recommended for expenditure from this committee or whether the council may expend funds otherwise. Ignore the legal part of that because I think sure, legally sure, sure. we can, but I'm looking um, for attention. Yeah, the intention was that the council would expend funds based on recommendations of this group. But again, if that needs to be more clearly spelled out, I would uh, I welcome suggestions on language. Or if you don't agree with me, you don't have to give me any suggestions on language and we can talk more. Okay, Kathy? Um, can, can you scroll back to the beginning of the bullets, um, Athena? So it just... Um, on the very first, um, if a concept was not in the report, which is hard to believe given the richness of the report, but um, when we received the report and I saw some things working with middle school and high school kids, I said, what about pre-K? And the response was, well, it, it hadn't really come up, but, but, but suppose... Um, Pre-K seem like a good place. So, are we limiting, are we limiting the potential areas to what was in the report, or could there be others? And it, this is a rephrasing what Mandy asked a little bit, but the, I read this as only if it was in the report can they be selecting. And I would like it to be a little broader. There have been some interesting. Um, there was an interesting initiative, and in, I think in the high school to teach kids about budgets and stuff with a target on, on black and minority that was very well received. So it was just a short course. So I could imagine something like that might be proposed and I'm not sure it was in the recommendations. So broadening it, um, providing recommendation for action. I think the first step, if I just go through it, action areas, so narrowing down to the action areas, because later there has to be a solicit of proposals and then coming up with which to recommend. So I would split the two. So they um, recommended action areas. And then later on, you're going to have to come back. So if you scroll one step down, I'm just putting a couple more bullets in, I think, on some of this. Um, so advise and make that you have to... Uh, except you have to solicit proposals from the committee community through a process before you can make recommendations um, to the council. So I would move solicit up, you know, so I think, so you got to figure out which areas you might want to be funding, get buy-in on that. Then you have to ask the community to give you ideas. You got to consider what those are and then come up with an annual or every two year, this is what we recommend for funding to the council. So I would just reorganize the bullets a little bit to think in terms of those pieces, starting with, are there, is the committee restricted to things that were listed or could they come up with some that are in the same concept area? So some of it is minor rewording of a bullet, but the accept, before you can accept a proposal, you have to, uh, I'll do CPEC. They have a process. They have a form. You know, here's here's how you apply, you know, and put in a report. It's not terribly onerous. It's like, give me a title and give me four words or five words and your best guess on what it costs. So you have to solicit them. And then um, this is what you're doing. Then you go through some 
process that's picking what you're recommending. So some of this is just changing the order. Um, so I, I think that's my main comments because I, I generally like the cleanness mm -hmm. of the way this was written and I just thought the logic of some of the bullets didn't make as much sense to me, the order of them. Uh, Pat? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I want to remind the council that this is a reparations for American slavery, for the kidnapping of Africans from their home, the stealing of their lives and their labor. It is not a rec uh, reparations committee um, that should be um, implemented by anyone but people who have um, by the black community. It's as simple as that for me. And when I say that, it still is true by the charter and all legalities that the final decisions about allocation of funds will happen in the council. But the decisions about whether to prior, how to prioritize the report that's already been done needs to be made by the people on this committee. We need to be able to understand that this is not a one-year committee, a three-year committee. This is an ongoing committee, hopefully for years and years, uh, that we will, we have committed, what, uh, several, a couple of million dollars, and hopefully more money will come into this fund. So the decisions made by the um, AHRA are a starting point but con collaborating and pursuing reparations projects and initiatives that arise from both the community, but also from concerned committees in town is critical to the kind of fluidity and flexibility in decision-making and um, implementation and creatively using town-appropriated funds to repair harm. So there are elements that, you know, what Kathy said and that, uh, you know, make sense to me. Um, but I want to be very clear to everybody, this is not a committee that is going to be, um, that should be uh, managed or, or implemented by anyone but the people who have experienced harm. Anna? Um, I want to address Kathy's questions. So, yes, Kathy, we did write this with the intention, for in the example you gave of including pre-K in a recommendation that wasn't there before. Um, we did include the uh, that bullet point of um, advise and make written recommendations. We had a lot of discussion. Uh, about whether to include the words based on the report or not. And we landed on not for just the reasons you said. Uh, and I, I think I, I spoke to this when I was talking to Mandy Joe as well, is we wanna give this group the latitude to address needs that were not thought of at the time of this report, even though, like you said, it's hard to believe given the thoroughness of that report that there might be something like that, um, but it's possible. So we wanted to give them the latitude uh, to, to make advise and make written recommendations um, uh, and and re uh, excuse me, provide recommendations for action to the council. Um, we were, in terms of the order, these are not intended to be directly sequential. Uh, they're not numbered in that way. They're not, they're, they're bullet points. While there is a natural logical process to reviewing the report first uh, and, and re providing those recommendations first, we do not, these are not intended as a um, sequential list and agreed they absolutely will have to accept proposals before they advise um, on future funding requests. However, in this first round, they will be probably starting simply with the report uh, and making initial proposals from that. So it's not intended to be a sequential and I could argue both ends of if you wanted to look at it sequentially one way or an another, uh, about where that bullet goes, but ultimately I don't think that it changes the work of this group to move that bullet. Uh, I, I believe that the group will 
create a process by which they accept recommendations, review them, and or accept proposals, excuse me, review them, and then make recommendations to the council uh, in that order. Councillor Haneke. Uh, so now I'm a little bit more confused after honest explanation. Um, on on what the intention of this committee versus our role in it is. And I guess that's what is even more unclear now. Um, reading the language and and hearing what Anna just said, it sounds like the committee establishes the priority levels and then tells the council what they are. Um, and then the committee makes recommendations on expending of funds based on maybe those priority levels, but maybe not because there doesn't seem in this charge any connection between the priority levels and the recommendations for expenditure of funds. And it doesn't necessarily indicate in the charge and in, including what Anna just said that the council must adopt priority levels at any point in time regarding recommendations on, I think as Kathy was trying to say, action areas, um, or the the report itself had a housing set and an education set and all sorts of these areas. And there's nothing in here that says that the council has any involvement in any of that except funding recommendations. And so am I understanding that correct, that if we form this committee, the only role the council has in rep reparations in the future is to fund recommendations and no other role? Um, and then I, I forgot one thing when I was asking questions. Um, I, if this is a reparations committee, this is one thing I've been pushing for a while in town manager goals and all. When are we going to fix our bylaws, policies, and regulations to remove structural racism from them. And this seems like the committee that we would charge with looking at the bylaws, regulations, and policies, and seeing if anything in there is structurally racist um, or ends up with racist outcomes, and then make recommendations on changes to those policies and all. We don't have it in CSSJC. We don't have it in HRC. Um, it seems like this would be a good committee to put that in, but it's not there either. And so shouldn't we be charging someone? Maybe that's us as the council. Maybe we should be doing it, but it seems like this would be a great thing for this committee to do if we form it to be making recommendations to the council and manager regarding revisions to bylaws, policies, and regulations to remove structurally racist outcomes that isn't in here. Um, and maybe it's somewhere else that we need to be thinking about that, but it seems like this might be a good spot. And I'm gonna put it out there before I finish. It seems like there's a lot of concerns about the actual language here and that maybe based on this conversation, a referral back to GOL is appropriate, I, but I'm not making that motion right now. I just wanted to put that suggestion I, out there. I um, appreciate the suggestion and have been thinking the same thing. Thank you. Anna? Sure, I mean, at any point, if someone makes a motion to refer this back to GOL, I'll happily take it, but I would ask that that motion be accompanied by uh, uh, language suggestions. Um, so, Mandy, to your first point, our role as the council versus the committee's role, kind of echoing what Pat said earlier, um, the committee establishes the priority level. Once again, what GOL talked about is that this body, the town council, is not, we are not the uh, experts, we are not the, uh, as a body, entirely comprised of folks with this lived experience, um, we should not be looking at the priority level. That priority level is coupled with feasibility in order to get something reasonable presented to the council, right? Something that is a proposal for the next year or et cetera, et cetera. Um, we, the, the report did not come in prioritized. And so that's something that for us to be able to um, 
approve or act on any proposals that come forward, it's helpful to know what the priorities, priority levels of them are. So yes, to answer the, the question, the what GOL discussed is that the, the um, ABRC would be the body establishing the priority level. Um, and it does not indicate that the council adopt those priority levels because we did not think that they would. It was something that would come in along with the recommendation of this is what the body determined to be a top priority. Um, and then the, uh, da, 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 my notes, my notes, my notes. The council's role here is approving funding decisions. Um, I will speak for myself because this isn't necessarily a conversation we had fully at GOL, but I would argue that we are not the body to approve whether this group is pursuing reparative projects fully outside of the scope of the council. Um, and then the last thing that you said was if this is um, a reparations committee, when are we going to are we going to task them with looking at bylaws, et cetera? Uh, my my notes are it isn't that a counselor's job. I don't think that it's necessarily fair to task a committee with reviewing every single bylaw. Um, I again, and I'm speaking for myself. This was not a discussion we had at GOL specifically about bylaw review. But while my hand is up, I'm going to say it. Um, I I see that as the job of a counselor to propose amendments to bylaws, just as counselors have a, have proposed amendments to bylaws based on noise and concerns about nuisances or registration, rental registrations. Um, I see that as something we could do at any time and we should do if that is something that we um, feel moved to do. Um, I'd also like to just open up the opportunity for any other GOL members to um, speak regarding this conversation. Uh, I am not the sole memory keeper of GOL, and while I do take notes and wrote them into the report, I'd love if anyone else has anything to add on the questions raised today. Happy to hear those voices as well. Are there any other questions or comments from GOL or anybody else? Pat? Not, not as a GOL member, but when um, I was first on the council, the, one of the committees I was on was the bylaw review committee where we were looking to um, align the town's bylaws with the charter. It seems to me there are places where the a committee perhaps of counselors, members of DEI department, and perhaps the human rights committee could form uh, a, a working committee to do something like that. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Jennifer? I mean, I think the um that the that GOL working with the co-chairs of the um reparation the ARA have recommended this committee you know structure and I feel comfortable with that I don't feel in a position actually to second guess it I would feel comfortable voting for the recommendation as it came to us from G from GOL with the blessing of the co-chairs of ARA Councillor Haneke. So I'm not comfortable with the committee as proposed, and I recognize that people will take that language very differently than what I mean, but I'm still trying to figure out my words. The council is an elected body elected by all of the residents to spend money and to set priorities for the spending of money. If CPA is the closest committee that this committee was modeled on, the people adopted the CPA surcharge with priorities for how CPA money would be spent. That had to go through an election and a town meeting, I believe, before that surcharge was adopted and the clear priorities were put in through the law of CPA spending as to what the priorities for money are. Reparations as a word and as a concept to me is not specific enough 
that it be delegated uh, that the priorities as a priority that all priorities underneath be delegated to a committee instead of the elected body. Um, many people have many different thoughts of what reparations are. In fact, the AHRA final report has many different thoughts as to what reparations are. Um, and I believe that the people and the residents of the town have elected us as the council to prioritize what reparations looks like in Amherst. And this charge as written uh, delegates that authority to unelected individuals, um, to me too far away from the residents of this town. Um, I think this charge could be <clears throat> reworded to make it so that it is closer and the policy recommendations are closer to the residents. But as it's written now, it doesn't, to me, uh, meet what I think we were elected to do, and I think it delegates too much to a different body versus what we but were elected no. to make decisions on. I've raised my hand. I'd like to move that we refer this back to, to GOL for further work and that um, I seek a second. Second. There was a second. Having said that, I would also like to make sure that any other comments from the council are heard tonight and or forwarded to the chair of GOL, Anna, for part of our discussion, uh, which will take place at a future GOL meeting. I don't think it will be this Thursday, but Anna, you get to decide. It will not be. We're, that agenda is already. Um... Right. We don't meet this Thursday anyway. Yeah. Okay. So the motion's been made and seconded. We really should be... Um, uh, acting on that motion, but before we do that, are there other comments that people want to add? Pat. I, I just want to say that if I look at the CPA committee, it's unelected people. Um, and they proposals, their proposals are brought to the council and the council votes to fund or not fund each proposal. So how is this different? How is this not legal? Um, I understand the concern, Mandy, and I respect it. So hear that, please. But I'm just trying to understand the difference. Okay. Councilor Lord. Yes, thank you. I'd um, also like to speak to Councilor Haneke's last statement. How I understand it is we, the council, you all the council, because I wasn't council yet, voted with the public's good faith to allot this certain amount, two million for now. But I also, and so I think there, mm, I don't know how to say this. I hear your concerns about, oh, this other party, but it really does need to lie in the hands of the black community who has been harmed and historically continue, historically harmed and then continue to combat the structural racism on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you for bringing up that point. Like, okay, we're doing this, but what are we still doing to deconstruct that? So my, in my opinion, it's two different things. We, the town council like controls, not the best word, um, considers how much money will be allotted to this organization. And then when the black folks, the people who are descended from um, slavery and also the people who are not descended but are still affected by the harm come and bring suggestions you we as an elected body still have the power to shut it down um ooh, <laughs> i was late we as an elected body still have the power to say no if we decide it's against what our constituents would really be able to agree with so i just wanted to put my little yeah. opinion about your statement <clears throat> Yeah, so thank you. I don't know if that helps where I'm coming from. Councillor Walker. 
Um, thank you, Lynn. I also just had a few comments um, just in response to some of the concerns that Mandy Joe shared, just to share also my perspective and how um, I'm viewing this. And I also, I'm not seeing this committee as any different than any other body that sends recommendations to the council. Um, really highlight emphasis as on their sending recommendations to the council. So nothing they do is set in stone until the council approves it, which is that is what our place is in this. Our place is not to make those recommendations. And I think Anna said it very well that as a body, we do not hold the expertise to be able to make those recommendations. And so we're looking at the body that we're going to create that will have the lived experience that will have that will be able to make those recommendations to us. Um, and I think if we do have council members in the future who are also may have that lived experience and want to contribute, that they can also engage with that committee and their discussions and their meetings and share recommendations in that way. Um, and I think reparations, like what reparations are, what re reparations means, is going to be different to a lot of people because the harm that was caused was caused in so many different ways in so many different areas. And so how do you really begin to repair that? And that answer is going to be different for, for many different people. And so I think this really calls for a unique structure, but it's still sitting within the bounds of what we have allowed in the past with other committees. So it's really not honestly that unique in itself. Um, and again, we ultimately have the final say. So it will come to the council. I'm seeing this the same way as the CSWG sent us recommendations. And we have to this day not implemented every single recommendation the CSWG sent to us. The same with the Climate Action Committee. Like they have all sent us very comprehensive recommendations that to this day we have not fully implemented. And that is the council's, that is to the council's discretion. And we will continue to hold that discretion. Um, and I also just wanted to push back a little bit on the idea that this is far away from residents in this town because these recommendations will be coming from residents of this town. Um, there are many black and brown families and residents in the town of Amherst um, and they are a part of this town as well. The motion's been made and seconded to refer back to GOL. We're continuing Point of order. to add- Pam, Pam Rooney's hand is up. I I see it, yes. Oh, Thank okay, you. sorry. It's just to summarize where we are and then to say, and we're seeking any other comments from counselors before we do that. Pam. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to support sending this back to GOL. I think it's got enough structure. Um, I expect this committee to develop the structure, the, um, the guidelines uh, that they need to start creating and formulating projects and making good things happen. So I would like to see this move forward rather than back to the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? So we'll deal first with the recommendation to refer back to GOL. And upon failure, that will go back to the amended charge. Um, remember where we are. Uh, Kathy Shane. We're voting on whether to send it back to GOL. Yeah. Um, for, for changes as we've discussed tonight. It's not clear to me we've agreed on what changes we want to make, so I'm going to say no. Okay. Andy. Aye. Jennifer. No. Councillor Walker? No. Pat DeAngelis? No. Anna? No. Councillor Ette? No. Then Greasemers and I, Councillor Haneke? Aye. Bob Hegner? No. Councillor Lord? No. Pam Rooney? No. Councillor Ryan's absent? Motion fails. We're back to the amended charge. Let's 
So the motion on the table is to adopt the Amherst Black Reparations Committee ABRC charge as amended. A motion's been made and seconded. Are there other comments? Jennifer. And the amendment is the two years? That's the two years. That's Thank the you. only amendment that's been made. Councillor Haneke. I'm going to use my right to postpone so that I can, based on this conversation, come in with amendments to this charge at the next meeting, since I do not want to do that right now. Okay. Thank you. This is a non-debatable issue, and we will move on to the rest of the agenda. Um, several weeks ago, we began a discussion of the counselors, I mean, of the town manager's charge, uh, goals. And at that time we discussed housing. And I believe that we also discussed climate action. Yes? So what I'd like to do is see if there are additional comments that people would like to make looking at um, first, Goal three, economic vitality. There's four goals under that. I don't, uh, Councillor, I mean, uh, Athena, are you prepared to show those on the screen? Councillor Haneke. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Is this, is the purpose of tonight's conversation to give guidance to GOL given our referral of these to GOL for 2025, or is this sort of the follow-up to the last one? And will if this is the follow-up to the other one, are we going to have a chance before GOL talks about 2025 goals to have a conversation regarding guidance for those goals? Thank you for the question. First of all, it to some it to, it, to some extent this has now been meshed, but. This is regarding the first exercise. GOL has been charged to uh, now do a draft of, of town manager goals. My understanding in talking with Anna, and Anna, please correct me, is that our, at our meeting of GOL on the 17th, I think 19th maybe, um, we will come up with a process and we will use that process at the next council meeting to seek input on goals for FY25. Does that help clarify? Councillor Haneke? Okay. Uh, Kathy? I think I had a similar question because I thought some of the discussion and then when you had us try to sub-rank within uh, mm -hmm particularly goals that had many moving parts. I thought part of that was to inform Paul that some were more important than others, <laughs> um, you know, in terms of what he should be writing up on, on, on all of us is, are we also, I think what Mandy was asking, we're also looking forward because I personally think we have too many subparts on our goals. Um, and so trying to narrow them with an eye to, is this a goal for the coming year or is it an ongoing two or three year kind of goal? I also thought we're in a town that's got a major problem financing the things we would like to have. And none of us looked a lot at financial management because we think it's basically a good job. But if you're constantly not making core decisions, I think we should be at some point focus on that. So Lynn, you didn't you didn't pull that one out because you know that, that bond rating alone doesn't to me say that. So it's just I think part of this is to give GOL some guidance on think more narrowly. And I find it difficult to think this way with looking at the laundry list we've currently got. I just so I may be quiet, which is unusual for me. Anna? Yeah, so um, while this is not a formal recommendation of these goals to GOL, one of the things that I'm taking as 
chair from this conversation uh, and, and prior conversations really is that we've got goals that are all over the place in terms of scope, how long they take to accomplish, what accomplishment of them looks like, uh, and that it's leading to a lot of, um, I'll speak for myself, what can be frustrating conversations at the council level of figuring out what these mean. Uh, they mean different things to different people and how Paul can actually say whether they were complete or not and where they are council priorities and where they are town manager goals. So my plan is to bring to GOL um, my plan is to facilitate the GOL discussion in a way that looks at these areas as a starting block, looks at past goals as a starting block, and brings something to the council that actually shows actionability uh, and what's reasonable to be done within that year time frame. So um, I just wanted to shed some light on how I'm planning to use these conversations at GOL. Uh, we're not necessarily starting from scratch, but my goal is to not just cross out 2024 and write 2025. We need to figure out a better way to articulate annual goals so that they're actually annual goals and not broad areas of focus. Okay. I, Kathy, that's not directly as an answer to your question. No, it's, it's more just, just a, as a heads up for everybody. Kathy, you still have your hand up. Sorry, I forgot to take it down. So let me step back and just say, are there any additional goals that anybody would like to discuss at this time? If not, we will just wait for the process from GOL. Pam. I don't have a specific goal in mind right now, but I, but I like the concept of identifying something as sort of a short and long-term goal or medium and long-term because I'm I'm thinking about housing at Ball Lane. It's got to be at least a six-year project already, and it will be several more before it's completed. Um, I think it's it's okay to give credit to the the town staff each year for making it proceed along its path, but um, the actual completion is is quite a ways out. And if GOL can somehow incorporate that into the structure, that would be great. Thank you. Councilor Haneke. Uh, I want to echo support for cutting down all of these sub goals <laughs> to reasonability. Um, and and also some support for, for what Pam Rooney just said about short, medium, long. Yet, I also want to put my concern out there that if we start getting short, medium, long, we might be getting into the problem where we had our first year in 2019 when we looked at our town manager goals and there were like a hundred different subparts because they were so specific, you know? And so, so using the ball lane example, I don't think we should have a goal that says finalize and get ball lane operational. That's too specific. So I like the less specificity here that gives the manager some leeway to determine, you know, if we say um, affordable housing um, on the state housing inventory, it gives him leeway to determine where to put the resources and which resources to put into which projects, you know, is it this project or that project or that one not? Well, the goal says ball lane, so we can't do the East Street School because we have to do ball lane. And and I know we're doing both, but um, um, I, 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 I don't want us to get too specific, but I do think we need to be a little more careful on what we put in here and make sure we actually agree on what the meaning of any of these sub goals are. I think that's been a lot of hard to go back to housing. There's like four different sub goals that 13 people have 13 different definitions of um, and don't actually always agree. And so I think figuring out a way to prioritize that while being a little more specific as to what we mean on some of those would be good. Okay. Are there any other comments about the goals or any desire for any further discussion at this time? Seeing none, we're going to move on to, um, We've already done appointments. We're going to move on to committee and liaison reports. 
CRC, Pam Rooney. You're muted, Pam. Thank you. Uh, the CRC met on September 24th. It will meet again tomorrow night. Um, uh, and we worked on the solar bylaw. We are expecting input from, uh, we already have received input from town staff, and that will be discussed at tomorrow's meeting. Um, it, there will also be a short discussion about the university drive overlay and specifically what is the timing of our public hearing and um, essentially that. Uh, the, the planning board has has already posted a public meeting of their own, a public hearing of their own for the 30th of October. So we will clearly not be joining them. We will be holding our own meeting at their at their desire. I guess they wanted to have a separate meeting. That's it. Okay. Uh, elementary School Building Committee, Kathy Shane. I have nothing to follow up the good news that I gave last time. We're meeting at the end of October. If you looked at Paul's management report, um, he said maybe everything is finalized this week and, it, and we're ready to go. But I talked to him separately or I got, that there are no hurdles. We're, we're just going through the last piece of diligence. So maybe he can speak to I'm just waiting to see the trucks roll in. We'll get, we'll deal with that when we get to the manager's report. Thank you. Finance committee, Bob Hagner. Yeah, the finance committee met on last week on the second. Um, we really, it was more just sort of an informational meeting to get a summary of the, um, the um, four towns meeting and the, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, what should we call it? The, uh, the proposal from the superintendent? No, 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 oh. no, no. The, the budget coordinating group, ah, sorry. Thank you, BCG. Lost okay. my uh, lost my finger. Um, basically, uh, this coming year is going to be a tough year. We knew that um, we're, we've got a lot of issues that um, have arisen primarily because um, costs are going up faster than the tax base, uh, the increase in the tax base. So we're going to have to make some hard decisions this year. Um, the, um, the superintendent, or the new superintendent, does have a vision to change things uh, the way that things are done. Uh, she wants to shift uh, from level services funding, which we've always had issues with, to more performance-based budgeting, um, but it's going to take her some time to get there. Um, she did um, come up with some scenarios, which is uh, a starting point. Um, they're definitely uh, early in the process. They're not well, you know, well thought out, but they're, you know, something to, um, to sort of uh, get the ball rolling. Um, so she came up with six scenarios, different levels of base funding, sort of starting at 6%, which is what we did last year, uh, with a 4% increase for FY26, down to a, a scenario which is, well, I'm not going to go to 6, but scenario 5, which is a 4% base, uh, which is what we proposed last year with a 2.5% increase, which is what we uh, got um, from the from the town manager um, for the uh, the coordinate the budget coordination group. Um, unfortunately, the only one that results in well, I should also say that the superintendent has proposed a significant um, restructuring of the um, regional schools to move the seventh and eighth grade out of the current building into the high school building. So it would be seventh through 12th um, and basically get out of the, the, the middle school altogether. 
Uh, and that, with some other uh, budget cuts, she has recommended two point, about $2.4 million worth of savings um, over the, the, the next year's budget. Um, unfortunately, the only scenario that results in a surplus for the schools is the scenario one, which is a 6% base for FY25 and a 4% increase. And that would uh, result without any, you know, discussions, but just the, but the sheer numbers um, that would add roughly six hundred and fifty thousand dollars to what we need to put into the schools over what we've proposed in the two per two point five percent increase. So we we have a lot of you know issues to deal with re related to the school budgets. Um, Kathy did suggest some ways we might consider reducing or finding some of this money. One is to uh, reduce what we put into the capital um, uh, stabilization fund. One is to um, reduce what we're paying for OPEB. And then she also talked about maybe restructuring Crest to some extent. So again, these were this was just an initial discussion and uh, I think we have a long way to go before we're ready to have some real serious proposals. But I think we, we now have some parameters we can work with, and I think it'll be helpful in our discussions moving forward. Thank you. Okay, Kathy? Yeah, I just adding on Bob's great summary, um, we were focused on the regional school budget. We haven't yet seen the elementary school and they had a heavy reliance last year, this current year on ESSER, which will disappear. So I'm at, and anticipating that we're not gonna hear everything is coming up roses in the elementary world either. And we all heard, um, well, actually I heard it for the first time at the superintendent meeting that health insurance right now is projected to be up by 13%, which is really bad news. Okay. Um, GOL, Anna. GOL will be meeting again on the 17th. We are starting in on goals uh, and are anticipating having some proclamations come before us as well. We are in a holding pattern until we, uh, until I think it's CRC finishes with the hearings that they're conducting uh, and their bylaw, the bylaws that are currently with them come to us. But we've got plenty on our plate. Uh, in this past meeting, we also discussed the legislative process guide, which was a carryover memo item from last term uh, that is shaping up to be, I don't know what it's going to shape up to be yet. We're still having those discussions. So if you're interested in tuning into those in the future, uh, keep an eye on the GOL agenda. Um, that's our that's our plan for our next meeting. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jones Library Building Committee. Pam. Thank you. That meets tomorrow. Um, excuse me, on Wednesday, the 9th, uh, starting at 1230, they are going to begin the portion of the Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act on how to address adverse effects on historic properties. So there will be a consultation process with, um, I think, four, at least four uh, entities who have registered as as interested parties, and then a good long list of of other entities who also would like to have an opportunity to speak about it. So that'll be very interesting. Okay. Paul, did you have anything to add on that? Okay. Um, TSO. Yes. And I have a quick just I have a quick question. Yes, uh, Kathy. Pam. Pam, are there new diagrams? or anything that we can see on the final changes? Uh, as a matter of fact, yes. I just opened up the 100 page set, I, you know, viewing on my little screen this big, uh, tried to go through the architectural drawings today. Um, so I can send those to you. If anyone else would like to see that, you're welcome. I'll share it as well. <laughs> If you're going to send it to anybody, you should send it to the full council with a link. Thank you. Does the whole council want it? You're just going to send a link. If they want to ever open it, it's up to them. 
Uh, it's not a link. It's a, it's a, like a PDF. Okay, fine. Thank you. Yes. So when, yes, I, when, when we are, when somebody asks for something, I make it a general practice to provide it okay. to everybody, even if they have not asked for it personally. Okay. That's Thank just, you. I will do that tonight. Okay. Uh, TSO, Andy. Yes. Uh, well, I, you do have the report and it was the report of our last meeting on September 26. And, uh, it, uh, so I think it speaks for itself and I'll just respond to questions about it and, um, but touch on it by going on to our meeting for October 10, which is Thursday of this week, which we just, uh, um, I don't know if it's been posted, but we have an agenda for posting. Uh, so I can talk about it. And I just want to make sure that uh, we're well aware of it because there's so many things that you have assigned to the committee. Um, what we tend to take up primarily at Thursday's meeting, and this is uh, reflected in the report, is going to start with uh, the University of Massachusetts request to place uh, campus vehicular directional signage in the public way. Um, we, the, we've made several requests of the uh, uh, staff who are working on this at the university. They have provided that. It's in the packet or going in the packet um, of, for the meeting on Thursday. And uh, we think that uh, it's likely that um, it's going to answer the questions that were asked at the last meeting of this body and um, the questions that we have and uh, that we uh, anticipate, but, but never say definitely will promise, uh, but anticipate that uh, we'll have a recommendation um, after this meeting for the council so that we can move forward and get at least that one out of the way. Um, a much longer process is going to be also talked about, and that is the uh, intersection improvements to Southeast Street between Main and College Streets. Um, that is a, uh, a far more complicated process that we're going to have to engage in. We know that um, TAC, which has worked very hard in uh, being the linkage to safe routes to schools, and thinks about these issues in general, and the Disability Access Advisory Committee um, all have an interest in providing comments on it. Uh, we want to make sure they do. We want to try and do it in the most efficient way possible. So that what we're trying to do, and I've contacted the chairs of those two committees, and I had in the uh, com the committee had in its report a request that if you have um, issues that need uh, refer need referral to town staff uh, so that we can get all of that put together into one listing and present it to um, the relevant staff um, that would be ideal and so and that is going to be the purpose of a large portion of the meeting not talking about the uh, evaluation of the process uh, of the proposal, talking about the information that is needed and needs to be answered in order for the committee and ultimately the council to take action. So that if you have any questions that you want to um, suggest to TSO, um, we would need that uh, Wednesday in the afternoon so that we have it available to the committee for the committee to work in on when it meets on Thursday morning. So those are the um, two principal items. So there are going to be some town manager appointments. The other two things that are, of course, out there is the Ways Taller program. At this point, um, that's uh, sort of we're waiting now for um, reports on what um, the town manager is going to be proposing on a process to uh, hire a consultant and uh, 
uh, in order to develop the uh, RFP that we have asked for regarding waste taller, and then the proposed uh, transportation parking uh, commission charge is the other large one. And uh, uh, what happened was is that uh, by agreement of the committee, Councilor Ryan made a proposal for a process. We, uh, as a committee, then met and uh, agreed to the process that is in the packet for tonight's council meeting. Um, what is we're going to do is uh, when Councilor Ryan is back in town, which will be after won't be until after the meeting uh, that we're having this Thursday. Um, he is going to then take responsibility for um, assigning uh, the various topics to a series of meetings, and uh, we're going to take up pieces of it as as proposed in his uh, his memorandum, which is in the packet, and uh, proceed with uh, different members of the committee taking responsibility for being the lead on different sections. So that is uh, how we plan to proceed, and uh, I'll just respond to any questions. Are there any questions? Seeing none, I'm going to move on to liaison reports. Are there any liaison reports? Seeing none, uh, we've approved the minutes. We're to the town manager's report. There's a written report in your packet. Paul? Thank you. Yeah, it could be in your pocket. You could do that too. Could be. Um, so remind people that, that we do have a ribbon cutting for the um, Pomeroy Village Roundabout on Friday at 4 p.m. So you're all welcome to join us. Um, also on Friday, doing a cup of joe with Stephanie Ciccarello mm -hmm. because we have so much going on with sustainability. And this is going to be at the Futura Coffee um, establishment up in uh, in District 1 and in, um, in the Mill District. The um, Also, just, I mean, your constituents will know about want to know about the leaf pickup. There's a whole lot of information in, in the town manager report and on the town's website, but that's usually a big thing for folks. Um, the... Um, the library, you know, we we do have the 106 review, which starts on, which is a pretty long process that will happen on Wednesday. Um, and then we also, as you know, has, as reported last time, the bids are out. Bids for the building are due on October 31st. And the school, uh, we have not awarded the bid yet. We're still in reviewing those proposals um, and hopefully uh, clearing away any kind of things that any legal um, issues that might pop up and so make sure that we award the bid clearly and uh and with confidence so we're very confident that we'd like to do that this week um yeah that's it are there questions of the uh, of the manager okay seeing none um under town council comments uh this is i'm sorry pat you have your hand up Oh, okay. Um, can I get to that in just a moment? Okay. Uh, written president's report is next time. Future agenda items. I just would like Andy um, Steinberg and Mandy Johanneke, who both serve on various MMA committees, to decide at what point they might like to share with the council some of the um, uh, goings on, if you will, are the proceedings of those committees. And I would just ask that they let me know when that would be appropriate. Um, regarding the future agenda items, um, under, pre under October 21st, we will hear the Human Rights Commission report uh, and GOL, as we have discussed tonight, will come forward with a process to discuss town manager goals. Um, the ABRC charge will be back on the agenda. Um, the UMass signage request may be on the agenda and a school zone proposal. On November 4th, as I mentioned earlier, we meet at six, that's financial indicators. Uh, and while we may have some resolutions, most of that night will be devoted to financial actions 
regarding appropriations and transfers, because by then we usually have free cash certified. And November 18th, we have a regular count meeting. We do the reading for the town manager's evaluation. We'll pause and do a public forum on the budget and then return and have various other items as well. Are um, there other future agenda items? Pardon me, Lynn, may I please ask the counselors to um, let me know if they're gonna attend the November 4th BCG meeting in person. We have a large group this time with the school committee, library trustees and regional school committee members. And so I wanna make sure I have seats in the room. So please get back to me if you're coming in person. Thank you, we'll, we'll send something out specially to make sure that we have that, okay? Thanks. Thank you, Athena. We'll do that. Pat? Thank you. Today is the one-year anniversary of Hamas's terrorist attack against Israel, in which 1,195 Israelis and foreign nationals were killed and 251 were taken hostage. Hamas's attack started the fifth war between Gazans and, and Israelis since 2008, and it has become the deadliest war for Palestinians in the history of Israeli-Palestinian conflicts. I would like to quote from an interview with Ralph uh, Nader that occurred on Democracy Now! Gaza is about the size of the city of Philadelphia with 2.3 million people, people who before October 7th were already living in crowded conditions, sick and destitute from years of illegal Israeli embargoes. On October 8th, the day after Hamas's terrorist attack on Israel, the Israeli military issued the genocidal orders of no food, no water, no medicine, no electricity, no fuel for Gaza, and they proceeded accordingly. With over 130,000 bombs and missiles, plus daily tank shelling, ruthless sniper fire, there has been massive destruction of apartment buildings, congested marketplaces, refugee camps, hospitals, and health clinics. Masses of families huddled in schools have been blown up. Ambulances have been blown up. Bakeries destroyed, schools, universities, mosques, churches, roads, electricity networks, critical water mains, just about everything and everything has, uh, just about everyone and everything has been destroyed." End quote. After hearing this and noting that the New York Times and other papers were reporting about 41,788 Palestinians had died, I had to ask myself several questions. How is it that only 41,788 people have perished in Gaza since October 7th? I have asked myself, and we must ask ourselves, how many living, breathing Palestinian women, men, and children died in bombed and in collapsing homes, schools, hospitals, refugee camps, or churches and mosques? How many children have been shot by Israeli snipers as they walked to school or the market or simply played in previously bombed rubble? How many people have died from lack of food, water, and medical care? Back in July, the British medical journal, The Lancet, estimated that indirect deaths due to illness, starvation, lack of water, or lack of medical care were well over 300,000 and predicts that by the end of 2024, one million people will have perished. We must acknowledge that the actions the Israeli government continues to take in this war are genocidal. To do less is to deny the humanity of the Palestinian people in Gaza, here in Amherst and around the world. For these and other reasons, I am calling on Amherst residents to investigate and participate in the boycott, divest, sanction movement. The BDS movement is an ideologically diverse human rights-based movement to pressure Israel into accordance with international law and defend the equality and rights of past Palestinians. Thank you. Councillor Haneke. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up on um... Lynn's comment about my membership in the Municipal and Regional Administration Policy Committee and give you an update because it doesn't have to be very long. <laughs> um, we're Thank at the you. end of a session. So yeah. so what the I, I'm on municipal and regional administration. So we talk about municipal and regional administration. 
Um, the two things we're working on now are the legislative package recommendations for the 2526 legislative session that would start in January, as well as a potential resolution to the MMA as a body for the MMA conference, um, Connect 351 in January. Uh, both of them are, are sort of on the same stuff, but I, I'll just summarize the package that we're thinking about. We have not adopted it yet, and then it once we would make a recommendation, it goes to the full board that Paul gets to vote on um, on that. So it could change, but but this will give you an idea of the things we talk about in committee. Um, permanent option for remote public meetings. Um, the bills that deal with that, the bills that deal with local options to increase a civil penalty from the 300 that we always put in our local bylaws up to 500 in the local bylaws. Um, shared services and regionalization bonuses, which I can get into more specifics as people want. Reforming legal notices, um, those things that are very costly to towns. We're, we're looking at supporting, actually re-supporting uh, changes to those legal notices. Procurement parity and technical corrections to public construction law. Briefly, the school, the school public procurement has a different limit than the municipal public procurement laws. And we are looking to, again, support making them the same limit. Um, payment of veterans benefits, it's very technical. Um, uh, extending the right of first refusal timeline under chapter 61A, some of the first refusals, we've done this before in council where we um, have a certain amount of time if there is a chapter 61A, which is I believe in the um, APR, um, or forestry, I forget which one chapter 61A is. Um, if someone, if they want to sell it and take it out of chapter 61A taxing, the town has the ability to buy it at the same price. And there's a timeline for that. Um, we're looking at, again, supporting extending the right, extending that timeline to be a little bit longer. Um, giving more municipal control of liquor licenses and um, alternative delivery of infrastructure projects, um, greater private sector participation and financing and delivery of projects. Uh, if anyone wants any more specifics on that, as you can see, it's a whole lot of stuff that is very technical, um, very specific, but helps municipal government operate more efficiently or less costly or things like that is what we deal with. That's just a small portion of the bills that we've talked about in the past two years for the past legislative session. All of those would be refiled. They're all currently filed and were not acted on in this current legislative session. Okay. And let me mention that uh, Councillor Ette and myself and Councillor Haneke were at the legislative, um, the MMA legislative breakfast this past week. And I believe, Andy, you're planning to go this Friday, and other people may also be planning to go. It was very useful. As soon as we get the slides, we'll distribute them. Andy. <clears throat> yes, so I was, um, I'm not going to give the, the, the length of the report that Mandy gave now, because I think I'll save it for the, another meeting. Uh, but to a large extent, we've been in the last months focusing on the same type of issues, but where it deals with financial um, policy. And one of the biggest resolutions that gets uh, the largest amount of debate every year is the uh, financial, the the but uh, what our priorities are for the budget, and our statement to the legislature about the partnership between um, state and, and municipalities as far as uh, financial matters. And uh, so the other thing is to work on uh, what bills we recommend um, that are related to financial matters. And uh, those, there's a process that it goes through all of the policy committees that Mandy has referred to already because it, uh, it, it's a process where uh, people from various um, components of MMA come together in, in these committees that have expertise in that area or chosen because of their knowledge of those areas. 
and make recommendations to staff. Staff then develops and uh, uh, the committee sign off on uh, a draft which will be submitted to the board and from the board, if the board approves it, it goes to the membership at uh, what has been called the annual conference and is now has its new name. So that is the process. Uh, and the what we did in the last meeting in the part that I will just mention very briefly is that, um, you know, each of us talked from our own experiences and things that we know about that are happening in the region. Uh, and you know, quite frankly, uh, there were sort of what I was pushing forward most strongly was uh, two sets of issues. Uh, one has to do with anything that you might talk about in relation to school funding, whether it be uh, uh, the chapter um, 70 or uh, the charter school issue. And, uh, you know, the, those were things that we've been talked about in the committee and are trying to move forward with. Um, and uh, the other, um, and those are, um, all of these are complicated matters because various members of the um, committees have represent different communities that may have be affected differently by changes that are proposed. And we have to remember that the MMA is trying to come up with an approach that uh, represents all of its members, which is very hard when there is some reality that the uh, beneficiaries of some of, of one thing like the Student Opportunity Act have put other um, school town school districts in a position of getting minimal increases each year, and so that the there's winners and losers within our own membership. It makes it a very difficult process uh, for that committee and for the organization to try and come up with something because it, um, in, in the end, our strength is, is an organization is speaking for everybody. Um, so that was one area. And the other one that I continually press on without going into uh, any more detail of the specifics is uh, the pilot, the question of pilot payments by nonprofit um, so that are, and then the pilot payments for state-owned land. And of course, the University of Massachusetts is a big piece of state-owned land that we get relatively small funding for because they don't think about the question of what is on the land or how the land is used. They only think about in the formula the amount of land so that uh, you know, if you have a, you know, a huge state forest that's a significant portion of your uh, municipality, uh, uh, it uh, contains more land than uh, university campus uh, frequently. So um, these are uh, these are tough issues for all of those reasons. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that if you uh, don't normally look at the MMA uh, monthly publication that we get a link to, um, the, which is, uh, I would very much encourage that you do take a look at it for this last issue of the Beacon, um, that there are a couple of things that you'll find in there. Uh, one is a, a picture of uh, our, the clerk of our council and the program that she is going to be presenting. And the other is there was a uh, whole article about our recreation department and um, a very innovative program that we've heard about. But, uh, you know, it was nice to see it getting the statewide recognition through the Beacon. So I urge everybody to find that link that you received, look at the Beacon and look for those two articles. Okay, thank you. Are there any other Councillor comments? Seeing none, I'm going to make a motion to adjourn and seek a second. Okay, we, we do a roll call vote for this. I'm going to begin that roll call vote with um, Andy Steinberg. 
Yes. Jennifer Todd. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Dillon Gothier. Aye. Councillor Rette. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. And Councillor Ryan's absent. Kathy Shane. Yes. It is, it is unanimous. We are adjourned at 944. Thank you.